Oh, you got some headphones if you want to use them, Edgar. They should be hanging. Do I need uh, to use them? Well, they help me. Some people don't like them. Well, put, put them on. Put them on. And see what it sounds like. So it to me, it just helps. You got sound in them? Yeah, I do. You got sound in them? Yeah, yeah. to me, it if just. If I ain't got to wear them, I don't want them. No, don't wear them. I don't either. wear them either. Blake, Blake and Chili don't wear them. You live. Oh. Good gosh, tech guy. You jumped the gun on that a little you bit, said, didn't you? You said you ready. Go. Holy smokes. Is, we're live on YouTube? Yeah. <laughs> What's up? Where's my camera at? <laughs> What's up, YouTube? Uh, is anybody watching this thing? Wait, it's an odd time to be live on YouTube. 82. Okay, well, they'll, they'll file on in, hopefully. Uh, you know, most people that watch YouTube, they don't work. So they just sit around and watch YouTube. You can go live on YouTube anytime, man, and just hundreds of people show up. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool. What's up, YouTube? Uh, well, yeah, you probably have noticed by now. We are in a different spot. This is actually our first broadcast from the new studio, which, by the way, is not completely set up. Tech guy's been dragging his dang feet. <laughs> He's slow to order stuff because he hates spending money. I what literally, dude, we had this thing set up just like this. I walked in just a few minutes ago, and tech guy had had everything moved around. He said, what do you think about that? I said, nah. I don't like that, man. I think it, I think it upset him a little bit. Oh, I don't care. Are you upset, Tech no, Guy? No, I don't. I don't care, man. Whatever. I'll just let you set this thing up. I'll, my lights come in today, and my camera. I'm gonna give them to you and let you go to town. No, no. Yep. Uh. So, yeah, guys, we're gonna continue. This thing will be ready for y'all, hopefully, depending on if the Tech Guy wants to do his job or not. It'll be ready for y'all by Wednesday's episode. But today, no. what? No. It ain't going to be ready by Wednesday? I doubt it. You keep talking like that. It might not be ready by two Wednesdays. What the crap, man? Uh, anyhow, y'all let us know how you like the new setup, you two. This is for you guys, by the way. So once he gets it all done, y'all can let us know how you like it. By the way, we have the absolute pleasure of having Edgar No Frills Mills. In the stuff. studio today, son. Looking good too. Boy. Look at him, son. You got the camera on him. Look at him over there. This Joker got the tan, got the got the sunburn going. Just oh, oh, look, dude. If y'all don't know about Edgar, we've uh we've known Edgar for quite a while now. We've ran some courses joint with Osprey Shooting Solutions. That's Edgar's company. Uh You've probably, hopefully, heard him on the podcast uh, in the past, and also you've probably seen his mug on YouTube uh, beating the brakes off of me out there on his range. We need to do that again, by the way. Yeah. That video's almost got a million views now. Yeah, I think awesome, man. it's went off the ch it, yeah. it just went off the charts, man. Uh, but what you might not know about Edgar, because you don't know him like I do, is Edgar Mills is the real deal. All right. I will I, I I not that Edgar needs me to vouch for him, but I, I'm vouching for Edgar for all you guys on YouTube that don't know Edgar. He's the real freaking deal. When it comes to tactics, when it comes to shooting, when it comes to uh any TTPs or methodology behind shooting, Edgar eats, sleeps, and breathes that stuff. And let me tell you, man, a lot of people I've heard I, now. Now, don't take this the wrong way, but a lot of people think you're cocky, and I have to explain to them: No, Edgar's not cocky. Edgar has thought through this. He's tested it. He has he has held it to the fire, and that's why when you come at Edgar with something that you want to do freaking different, and he's already proved your your way wrong, he'll just straight up tell you. No, nah, man, that ain't the way you need to be doing it. You need to do it this way. Not because he has some emotional attachment to the way he does things, but because he's freaking tested it. He's thought about it. He's thought it through. He's put it into action. And he's, he's seen if it would hold up 
to criticism. And he's the real freaking deal, man. I'm going to go ahead and tell you. Welcome to the studio, Edgar. Thanks for having me again. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, we're glad to have you back. It's, 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 it's been too long, man. You know, I talked to you the other day about at some point, maybe sitting down. There's so much, there's a lot of crap going on, man. It, as usual in the world. And, and people are, as usual, confused. They don't know. They, they, they don't, people don't, they want actionable steps. They want to hear from people who don't just have some agenda to promote. They want to hear real talk from real people. Um, and I've talked to you about maybe sitting down and doing this on a on a on a more regular basis, and so maybe we'll do that. But uh, I got a question for you before we even start, All right. before we even dig into this. What what is your favorite shoulder fired shoulder fired rocket launcher out of these three? The Law Rocket, the AT four. Or the Carl Gustav. Gustav, man. Thank you. Yeah. I would have picked the exact same yeah. thing, man. You got you got all the variety. You got all the different uh types of rounds. Reloadable. I mean, that's a that's a no-brainer right there, man. Yeah. 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 Uh I, I always I don't know why, but I always felt like with the AT4 or the Law Rocket. I never felt like I could really hit anything with them. Like I could cut, I could get in the general vicinity, but man, when you get dialed in with the Carl G, that Joker is accurate, man. Yeah. It's an accurate and, and not to say maybe I didn't spend enough time with the AT4 and the law rocket because I shot, I taught the Carl G on the line uh, in land warfare for a year. Yeah. And so I got into that rocket launcher I mean, I sat down with the, the manual that nobody does that, by the way. Like, right. I had to dig through. You read the manuals, man. <laughs> I had to, nobody in the SEAL yeah, teams do that. I know. <laughs> I had to dig through the freaking case that the Carl G comes in and the manual's like in the bottom, yeah. like underneath yeah. all the packing material. Nobody's ever even cracked that thing open yeah. before. So when I got tasked to teach the Carl G inland warfare, I pulled that thing out and I, I started reading about it, all the different types of rounds all, and how, how the, 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 the weapon system works and how to sight it in and how to be accurate with it. And, dude, I spent like an hour in that manual and it opened my eyes to how awesome yeah, that rocket awesome. launcher is. Far more versatile than, than the other two. For sure. Yeah, and, uh, and you can carry different loadouts with you, you know, in your truck and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's definitely the superior of the three. That's outstanding. Yeah. I'm I'm glad I'm glad we can agree upon that. That yeah. makes me feel good about myself. What's the downside though? The downside to the Carl G? You gotta have another dude reload for yeah, you. Yeah, you do. Yeah. And and that's and it. that's and, no big deal. That's not a downside, really. Well, and I would say too, with the Carl G, obviously it's a little harder to haul that thing around. Yeah, it's a little um, harder. Yeah. You know, like the law rocket, you can sling that joker yeah, on your back and <laughs> yeah. you can rock and roll with yeah. it. Yeah. So, but also these days, uh, you're still out there with a the law. You got about a 50, 50 chance. That thing's going to go it, it's probably malfunction or misfire. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, did you ever get to play with the javelin? Uh, I've never shot a live javelin. I, I mean, haven't. Either. We did all the, the simulators every time we deployed and all that stuff, but, um, I never shot a live javelin. So, I heard a lot of good things about it. I never got to to shoot a live round yeah. with a javelin either. But essentially, what I remember about that is, it's a it you pretty much guide. Don't you have like some way to guide yeah, that round? Lock, yeah, you can lock in on target, and once it locks in, you hit the button. That thing's gonna go. Now the rocket, you know, it kind of. Depending on range, I mean, it's a long, long range weapon. When I say long range, you know, 4K or whatever, the I can't remember what the max effective range is. Uh, but yeah, once you lock that little radar system in to, uh, from the, the clue, mm -hmm. is the sighting system. Once you lock that thing in, hit the button, it's, it's going to go. Yep. Yeah, I heard a lot of good things about it. And that was a wild, uh, that was a, it, to see that rocket 
like to see it launched, it's weird, man, because that it fires off and like it goes thump, and it kind of yeah. comes out. And then, like, the, the afterburners yep. kick in, and yep. it's just like, is that thing going to go anywhere? And then, and then you see the rocket scoot up. Yeah. yeah. No, it's pretty cool. I, I wish I would had an opportunity, you know, fire a live one, but never did. There's a pretty cool, cool video um, of the early days of Afghanistan that they, they video, you know, shooting a live rocket on a, I think it was a technical. And, uh, yeah, they dead on, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I heard a lot of like, good things. huge valley. How that was cool. How do you think <clears throat> in, in comparison to the rocket launchers that we have in our US inventory? How does how do you feel about the RPG in comparison to like the AT4 or the Law Rocket? Hey man, the RPG is an incredibly effective weapon. And it's also versatile with the, with the easy to load. Mm -hmm. Uh yeah, I I'd I'd carry one around for sure. Mm -hmm. Like if we if we had that. Um, now we always had um, Gustavs to take with us around, but yeah, I think RBG, RPG is highly effective, and it's worth and it's still good to go. I mean, I don't know. I guess when they come out with those in the forties or fifties or something, there ain't no telling. Um, but yeah, I think it's highly effective. Um, underrated weapon the. And I'm pretty sure, I can't remember now, the rounds are drop safe, I think, but they got the little protective plastic cap. I wouldn't want to test the theory of <laughs> dropping those rounds, but I think they got a little little crystal in them that if you break, then it's armed. Mm -hmm. You know, in some of the American systems, you, there, there's such a, there's a distance. Spin, yeah, the spin rate on yeah. the round, yeah. But uh, I don't think they're drop safe, so that, that's the downside. But, yeah. I think they're incredibly effective. Now, I've shot RPGs a ton of times. Um, so, out to, you know, I, I don't, maybe a, maybe a thousand yards, but but definitely inside a thousand yards. Yeah. You can do the business with it. Jam up. Pro yeah. And probably the most, I'd say the RPG is probably the most tried and true. Yeah, man. That tested, yeah. fired. I would guess that based on, uh, Standing armies that use them and the terrorist groups that use them, I'd say they're high, <laughs> highly tested and proven. A hundred percent. Yeah, for sure. Yep. 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 All right. Well, um, for all of you military types, that's your uh, that's that's the segment for you right there. That's just, I like that segment, man. I mean, pe people don't. I, I mean, how many times you get to discuss stuff like this? Hey, man? if you're in the market, RPGs are probably cheaper. I guarantee you, they're a lot cheaper yeah. and probably a lot easier to get your hands yeah. on than a Carl G. There happens to be a fellow in town here. I won't name his name, but he owns one. I'll be dang, man. <laughs> Outstanding. Yeah. Well, uh, hey, brother, it's been a while, man. What's going on with Osprey Shooting Solutions? And for you guys that are watching, <clears throat> that's Edgar. Edgar owns a training company called Osprey Shooting Solutions. And why... Does why how is Edgar qualified to train people? How many years in the army do you did you or do uh, you have years 20, of service? Yeah, I was in, in for twenty five years. Twenty five years of service in the army, Green Beret. Yeah, Sixteen um, years in the Green Berets. Yeah, and so highly, highly qualified. Qu qualified, obviously. Like I told you before, I would say this is your passion. Yeah, right, Edgar. Absolutely, I love shooting. Uh, even when I was in, you know, I, I did a lot of shooting. When I did my staff time, which was at SOCOM, I was the marksmanship program manager. So I got to shoot all the time there, which was a big plus for sanity. Uh, I chased down pro shooters, follow follow guys that are at the at the edge of, of whatever innovation. Uh, there ain't a lot of changes with the fundamentals of shooting, obviously, but you know, guys who try the techniques, uh, that what superior techniques, right? You can have techniques that adhere to principle, but they're not as, as good as some other techniques. So I'm always trying to figure out what's, what's the fastest, most efficient. And so I keep up with a lot of those guys. I still shoot competitions. Problem is you got to chase matches up here in Northwest Georgia. You can go down to, 
Tallapoosa, or you can go out to Dawsonville. And those, <laughs> those are long drives, man. Yeah, that's a haul. Uh, <clears throat> I shot an IDPA match a couple weeks ago, and I, I won my division, and I was stoked. And then I looked at the division, at the division, and uh, there was only three dudes in it. <laughs> hey, man, I was thirteen overall. At, I, at least there was, yeah. at least there was yeah. somebody. I won a car show the other day yeah. with my Land Cruiser, and it was the only, was only four by yeah, four yeah. in the category. Yeah, so that's how I felt. I was like, oh man, no, no glory there at all. Uh, I was thirteen out of forty of all divisions, and I ran iron sights. Um, so I don't know. I didn't feel good about it, but I didn't feel bad about it. But, yeah, you, I do competition just to try to test myself against other humans because you ain't in no more. You ain't testing yourself against bad guys. Not that they're the best litmus anyway, but, yeah, competition shooting. I'm always reading. I'm always training. Trying, just trying to stay good because when you get out there and demo a, a drill, you better, you better nail it. Yeah, you ain't lying, man. Otherwise, you know. Now, they don't all go good, but you – you got to be able to perform at a high level in front of other people. Yeah. Can't do that. Just talking. Yeah. But you, so now, but you're kind of branching off with Osprey into other, other skill sets beside just range time. Oh right? yeah, man. Yeah. Southern Ornithological League. Yep. That's, that's my, now that's a little passion project for sure. It's not a different company. I'm just calling it. I, I'm trying to keep the two separate because I don't want to conflate what I do with Southern Ornithological League with shooting. Because, uh, as you well know, I don't like to teach tactics necessarily mm -hmm. uh, to civilians. Um, and is, is there a reason for that, Edgar? Well, yeah, man. The reason is, and it's not that I don't think civilians need to know these things or that anything's top secret or any crap like that. But if I had an individual for five weeks – they would still just be scratching the surface. Uh, do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So I don't want to have a one day course on CQB something or another. And then they think that there's some kind of CQB ninja. And some dude breaks in their house and they get smoked. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and they, they typically want to go a, a student, a, a civilian coming into a course, wanting to learn CQB there. I, I mean, 90, 9.9% of them are going to want to go way faster right off the bat yeah. than they need to go. Like literally you spend a week yeah. learning how to pass through the threshold of yeah. a door in the military. I mean, literally to, you spend a week learning how to walk through a door and take a few steps yeah. along the wall and that's it. And then you move on to the next thing. Yeah. So I, I get what you're saying. If you had five, if you had five, a five solid week block starting off with somebody from scratch, yeah. then literally they're going to basically know how to go in and clear an empty room. Well, but, and then number two though, uh, it's my opinion. And it's always been my opinion that CQB is a team sport. So unless you're on a team <laughs> that does, <laughs> tactical things like a SWAT team or, or mm -hmm. S SF or, or any kind of military team. It, it ain't a one man gig. I don't care what the CIS a said. You know, I mean, like it, it ain't a one man show. Like, uh, so, you know, and, that, and there's all kind of different CQB ain't rocket science uh, really, but everybody who wants to pay for these big dollar courses, uh, they, they'd be better served paying for shooting courses and learning to shoot the gun. Yeah, because it don't matter how smooth or fast you can enter a room if you can't hit your target uh, consistently with absolute confidence. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So I think shooting's far more valuable mm -hmm. than uh, any CQB class. And so one of the courses I do in Southern Ornithological League, there there's some. I don't even call it CQB. I call it Team SOP development. Uh. But it's a scenario. It's it's not a training course. It's a it's an experience. The the training value out of the course is teamwork and leadership. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there just happens to be CQB type stuff going on. But that's only so I can have these eight people at least get a couple of runs with each other, knowing so they can get a feel for what the other person's going to do. That's it. there's there's not a whole lot of tactics involved in that at all. Uh, so yeah, I don't I don't like to teach CQB. Well, I do like to teach it. I love teaching it to cops and soldiers. Yeah. 
um, somebody who is uh, like a relevant job. You know what I mean? But anyway, Land Nav is what I got coming up next with Southern Ornithological League. And believe it or not, man, that's one of my favorite to teach. That's 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 a Boy Scout skill. That's a friggin' life skill. That's yeah. Everybody should be able to land navigate to some degree. Uh, so yeah, that's what's coming up next. That's out there by your way. Slow out. Uh, well, it's up in Sloppy Floyd and what was that? Taylor's Ridge, maybe Penhody Trail. Yeah, there's some st- there's some steep hills and some good woods. Yeah, train's gonna terrain. be good good business. Now the yeah. good news is it's fall, so there ain't gonna be a lot of thick foliage on the trees, yeah. and yeah. you should be able to terrain associate pretty well. Yeah, and it's a daylight course. It ain't like the last one we did. So the daylight course, you got all day the sunshine, you got it all. So mm-hmm. it ain't going to be that challenging as far as distance goes. Terrain wise, it's going to be challenging, and it's not a self correcting. You get all your points up front this time, okay, and then you then we'll we'll check your work and then send you on your way, okay. So, so if you get if you get stuck on a point. You got all your points. Well, the, you're not going to pass the right. course, but no, you can right. go to another point. Exactly. If you if you show up to it now, every point has the grid on it where you're at. So if you find somebody else's point, at least you'll know where you're at. Yeah, yeah. So it's sort of self correcting, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the terrain is going to be challenging enough. The lanes are only about five miles or so cross country. That'll translate into about seven miles or eight miles probably and then uh yeah that's it man that's gonna be good the the classroom portion is the goodness of that it's i go very deep and robust the only thing we don't do in the classroom portion is uh lat long conversion i don't blame you nah (laughs) what what grid what grid system are you using the the UTM? universal grid system uh it's the same type that the military uses they call it well universal traverser traverse mercator is the whole system but for civilian maps it's called national grid system so you, but think, but it reads just like military you so you're using utm yeah oh yeah, yeah UTM. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah okay yeah that's what we use and too. we use uh one over twenty four thousand scale Yep. in the class because that's more detailed map and so versus one over 50,000. So it's what the, we used in the, all the time, which sucked. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. one over 24,000, um, very detailed. And especially with contour line, like you can get a really good feel for the train. And then we use, uh, I provide compasses and protractors and all that. And they get to keep those um, at the end of the course. But I like to use the the circle protractors, and then we put a little string in there so you can actually get a good azimuth yep. instead of those square ones. And uh, it's got a one over twenty four. It's got a one over fifty. It's got a, like one over a hundred and some. You know, it's got several scales on it. Um. So yeah, we provide the compass protractor and pace beads. So isn't is isn't land nav like a huge part of training for the green beret pipeline bro uh in selection it, yeah I, i'd say if you had the percentage wise it, it's over 50 percent. like yeah you spend a significant amount of time it's just one course after the next uh now selection changes here and there so sometimes they inst- they do instruction sometimes they don't when i went there was no instruction it was you were kind of expected to know how to land nav a little bit. And these were a bunch of just trial and error courses. Uh, but the star course is a, a must pass. Boy, that one was brutal. You know, that, that was a long, long, long course. You only had to five, find five points. But <laughs> the points were probably, you know, anywhere from five to 20K apart. And you're just going all over the Hoffman train area and up, up there in North Carolina. But, uh, and the and the 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 lanes were designed to send you through the thickest, most nasty draws and and swamps and everything like that. So, why do you why do you think why do you think the army focuses so heavy on land nav specifically for their special operations selection pipeline? Because if I 
think back to like the SEAL training pipeline, uh, we had, we had, you know, some land nav in third phase out on San Clemente Island, map and compass. Uh, then we had a block in Kodiak, Alaska. That was, that was the most in-depth block. And once we left Kodiak and, and, and we're talking about the longest single land nav evolution in Kodiak was probably four days, you know, out. Uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a difficult, it was a difficult challenge. I mean, you had a lot of terrain. It was, yeah, you yeah. could, you terrain associated the whole thing. Yep, yep. Um, but after that, you know, that, that was, that was pretty much it. Uh, why do you think, why do you think the army focuses so heavily on that? Well, I think, um, I think it's got to do with legacy, honestly. Okay. The foundation of SF. Cause you know, even, even the, uh, the unit patch is an arrowhead and, uh, and they, they put a lot of, they put a lot of value in the, in the heritage, the, the pioneer skills and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's why SF does it. If you look now, one of my favorite books of all time is OSS to green berets by Colonel Aaron bank. Um, if you read that book and you look at the beginning of SF brother, it ain't wildly different than it is now. There's a lot, it, a lot of similarities just to, even in the, the, the structure or, or the organization, the way, the way it's structured. But uh, honestly, it's legacy, man. Um, and, and everybody will tell you, you know, as soon as you need your GPS, the batteries are going to go down or, yep, or something's yep. going to go wrong. Um, so yeah, you, if you depend, if you're whole, totally dependent on, on technology, you're, you're going to be, you're going to be losing. I think that's a big reason. I think that's a big reason why civ civilians should seek out a good yeah. land nav course is because we are you guys watching you know man don't freaking lie you couldn't e look man i'm guilty of it most of us couldn't even find our way around the town that we live in without using that gps the maps on our phone yeah. i mean it it's it it's um we've lost even the concept of paying attention to cardinal direction and just knowing generally where we are at on the face of the earth. Uh, for most people, the concept of actually looking at a map or using a, a compass and a map together is like literally completely foreign. Yeah. Because we teach a lot of land nav too, just we just integrate it into other training. Right, right, you know, yep. we integrate it into the proving grounds. Yep, yep. We don't have a land nav specific course, right. but it is integrated into most yep. of what we do. And literally, dude, you I have seen hundreds of people pick up a compass like it's some <laughs> like it's a bomb, yeah, dude. Yeah. Like no <laughs> idea. And it's so simple. It's a, I think it's a foundation, like Edgar said earlier, it's a foundational yeah. baseline skill that every person should have a general understanding of. Now, I will say land nav, I believe is a perishable skill. It is for sure. Uh, it's a perishable skill, but if you can get a baseline foundational understanding of the tools, you can put it down for two years, three years. You can pick it back up two, three years later, and within an hour or two, a little bit of refresher, you're going to be clicking again, yeah. right? So, so let me say this. I am not a natural navigator without a map and compass. So now living in Colorado was easy. We had the mountains on the west. Yep. Yep. It was, it was easy. Um, but the technical skill of reading map and reading a compass I'm good at, right? Um, I can look, and as long as I'm staying on the map and, and constantly checking, I'm good to go. But, yeah, I'm not a natural. The way I used to do things, back in the day, they had a thing called pay phones. They were all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> and when I was young and I first got my driver's license, I was a wanderer. I like to go places. I like to go driving and see things. 
back in the day in these ancient things, the telephone boxes they had, the telephone booths, they had a thing that was called a telephone book, and it was paper, and it was thick. Thank you for that history lesson. Yes, old and man. in the back of those phone books, they had a map of the, wherever you were at. And I used to go and tear the map out, and that's how I'd get around town. Not even with a compass, I would just be like, "Okay, I'm I'm at this street corner and that street corner," uh, and that's how I'd get around and learn my way around. That's how I learned my way around Atlanta when I was young. Tear out the paper, look at it. You know, you got two eighty five, big circle. Yep. So they had a big map, and then and then they had a like. Uh, a more detailed map so, so that's that was my introduction i wasn't a boy scout or any crap like that no i wasn't either uh, and i said people also don't understand people don't also they don't understand like the basic function of of the two tools that you use to navigate that uh, we talked about the compass people yep. doing it but they also don't understand the compass is is absolutely useless without the map i i mean yeah, I mean, it, it, it's gonna, sort of. it's gonna, get, you, yeah, you can get cardinal direction using the compass without the map, but there are other ways for you to get cardinal direction unless it's not well. Even at nighttime, there are probably other ways if yeah. you know them to get cardinal direction. Um, so I ask people all the time when I teach land nav, well, if you could only have one, which one would you have? And it's it's amazing. Over fifty percent of people say. I would take the compass. Oh man. And it's like, no, man. Nah. Like literally, if you have terrain, you can throw the dang on compass and until it gets dark, you can throw the compass out. You, you don't even need to pick yeah. it up, man. Uh terrain or no terrain. Uh if you got a map, <laughs> you can start moving in a direction. Yeah. When the sun comes up, okay, I'm gonna move east. Or you can tell what's east. A hundred percent. No matter where you are on the map, like if you got a general region where you are, mm -hmm. you, you can move around with a map. So you teach you in this course coming up, you teach both dead reckoning and terrain association. Yeah. So dead reckoning, we do that during the classroom portion. That that's sort of an introduction to the compass and like walking walking on azimuth. And we do that on my property right there, short distances. Um dead reckoning, as you know, over mountainous terrain is, is no bueno. No. <laughs> You'd be walking up and down mountains all day long terrain association and the terrain that we're in oh, it's magical because you you can get around sometimes people don't really understand sometimes it's easier to walk two clicks out of the way on favorable terrain than it is to hit that straight point you know straight up a daggum cliff you know what i mean yeah so, yeah yeah we do dead reckoning for sure uh we spend a lot of time though on terrain um well one identifying on the map and, and then translating that and we do practical exercise out on my property as mm -hmm. well. Well, I actually kind of go over to the, the nature preserve. Yep. There's some real good terrain where we can examine the map and examine the terrain and like you can really see what's yep. going on. So we, we do some good practical exercises during the classroom portion. So you're teaching the students how to identify summits, saddles, the whole, draws, yep, all that. Yep. All that. For sure. Reading it mm -hmm. off of to topography. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Super, um, super valuable skill and fun. Yeah. Probably one of the funnest I things think it is, that you man. can do, man. Uh, I think it is. And I think the last course we did, regardless of the, it turned out to be a daggum endurance event, but um, the classroom portion, I think that, I think everybody enjoyed it. Um, it was interesting to me that you designed an endurance event. Well, look, man, it wasn't meant to be that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was 20 mile lanes. Look, Jonah come out and he said, all right, Edgar's putting on land nav. I'm going to, you know, I'm yeah. going to come out. We're just going to do it just to touch it. I walking. got a good picture of Jonah <laughs> sitting up against a tree. <laughs> I love Jonah. Yeah, we got to I hear all him. kinds of stories. Did he tell about you about that, sitting man. in some amp, uh, amp pile? Oh, dude, he came, he, I <laughs> oh, think man. he was at our house like yeah. right after that. And yeah, he oh, yeah. was <laughs> tore up, son. Yeah. When you land navigating at night, you can't just plop down anywhere and not not in, not in Georgia, but no. That, and that was what was that? Was that spring? Um, Were the leaves still on the trees? Oh yeah, well, it would have been fall, okay. right? Wasn't it? No, it was. It damn, no, the leaves were still on. It was leaves hot. were still on. Yeah, I remember it was hot. Yeah, Bugs it was, were it was out. spring. Yeah, uh, it was still hot out. Um, and it was in Talladega National Forest, over north of I twenty. 
near Piedmont, Alabama. That mm-hmm. that part of and uh, which is a hard that is a difficult area to navigate, man. Son, it, it was rough. You you know you know uh, this is my perspective on that area. Of course, you've trained out there, so you know more than I do. But the terrain out there, it, it's it's not small enough to consider it micro terrain, but you 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 have a lot of terrain features, but you don't have a lot of major, like you were talking about in Colorado, you know, you, you've yeah. got a, a major yeah, yeah. ridge line or, or s- some sort of handrail or yeah, something yeah. because it's, it's just, it's so rolling, man. Yep. And there, if, if you, and, and they all look the same, yep. all those little knobs and summits and draws, they all look the same. So at any point, if you get off, if you lose your spot where you are on the map, it's really difficult to recalibrate because especially with that sort of uh, foliage in there, you know, if you're out in Alaska, you're out in Colorado, you're out in Utah, if you lose your spot on the map, you've got so much massive terrain around you. I can shoot, I can shoot, you know, sight a few summits and I can triangulate my position extremely accurately. You can't do that in the Talladega National Forest. There's nothing big enough to do that. Especially with the foliage on. And you can't see out. Uh, especially with all that folks. But, yeah. Um, it's it's probably one of the most difficult places in the area yeah. that you could possibly navigate. What, what they're calling mountains over there, Mount, Mount Duggan and Mount this and that and the other is a hill in Colorado. Oh yeah. It's, it's just, just a hill. It's just a hill. So it's very important to be able to match your direction uh, move on your compass with the, the way you're moving. And if you're, if you're, if you're moving at one angle and you're reading 15 degrees different, you're lost. Like you ain't, <laughs> uh, and that happened. I uh, wanted to point specifically, but, um, and there's a lot of trails out there that either ain't on the map ain't on the map, or that's there's everywhere. trails on the map that ain't on the ground. That's everywhere. Every, that, at least that I've seen. Yeah. And I, yeah. And I get, that was a big, during the classroom, that was one of those foot stomps on the floor. Like, Hey guys, there's, there's phantom trails out there. And then there's like, and one, trails that were there 30 years ago and one of the points out there had that right uh and the magic answer was uh nobody found that point one one i think jonah and um greg found that point i think the red nobody else in the class did and uh so i asked everybody else well what happened? Well, this road went there i was like okay well the asthma's obviously way off so it wasn't that road yeah no we figured that and I asked, and there was, one, I was like, did anybody take a pace count from, from where you start the main road, which was a known point on the map, to where the point was? It's like, did anybody actually do a pace count? I got a bunch of. Well, why would anybody do a pace yeah, count? Yeah. You, you just <laughs> taught yeah, that yeah. to them just, yeah, yeah. just because you wanted to teach them something, so I got right? A bunch of, I got a bunch of looks and a bunch of eyebrows like, oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody did a pace count. to, to That would have that would have solved that problem. If they would have stayed on azimuth and on pace, so that at that point, that's where dead reckoning would have been. Once you realize that, man, this trail ain't here, or or whatever, yeah, dead reckoning would have would have been the answer for that. So, but you know, I mean, experienced navigators might might do that. People in a class is a learning point, dude. I want to do your course like that. Bro, that to me especially that one that you ran. I, I mean, I, this one that's coming up in what November, it's in a couple November of weeks, 18, right? 19, yeah. 18, 19. Yep. That's going to be an awesome course, but you've got this mat. That's going to be a great spot for beginners because you've got this massive ridge line right. to reset off yep, of. Yep. Right. Exactly. But Alan out in the Talladega national forest, I'm going to tell you, man, I'm a, I, so like you, I'm not a natural navigator, but I know how to use yeah, the tools yeah, to right. get to where <laughs> yep. I'm going. Uh, navigating out there i know well and then would, in the would, dark <laughs> would challenge yeah. the best navigators yeah. that exist without a doubt so here's here's what we've come up with um and me and justin and Corey talked about this after is the course we're doing next week or in 1819 that's a proper course uh educational course and the land nav exercise it's challenging enough, but it's proof of concept. Proof of concept. The one we're going to do in Talladega, we're turning that into a challenge 
we're not going to make that a course anymore. That's going to be epic, dude. We're just going to turn it into an orienteer race. Can I get in on that? Yeah, no, for sure. And when I get back and when we do all that, we, we will. We're going to do it. We're, we're going to try to either do it early, late winter, early spring, before leaves get on trees or And after in the deer fall. season. Yeah. Yeah. One or the other. That way, one, it's cool enough that you ain't out there because it, 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 was, it, was, it was hot. And <laughs> we had water at the base camp. Um, they all carried some water with them and they all, most of them had water purification method. Uh, but still, most was, of them? They were, yeah, it was coming back through. That was an option on, on the packing list. It was like, hey, you know, bring some water purification. Uh, a lot of, you know, they came back to base camp to get water and stuff. So, but we're going to turn it into an orienteer, orienteer race. That's going to be legit. And we're going to leave it the same, like, the, because it was a, it was epic. And you only have one team hit all the points, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then even then it was just one guy. Okay. Cause, cause then Greg, uh, Jonah was taking a little cat nap. <laughs> okay. I didn't hear that part of it, but Jonah left that out of the yeah. story. Well, Greg wanted to go find all of them and they were a team. So it counts, but, um, Greg, Jonah left that out of the story. And you know, I mean, and you know, Greg, um, he's a he's a wire. He's amped up. Yeah, and, Greg and he, came out of the proving grounds. Yeah, and he wanted yeah. to go do it, so he went and found them, and so they got them all. He might have left out also. Jonah might have left out also that uh, they thumbed a ride. They was walking down. Well, you, <laughs> did you, he tell you, you that? You, no, no, he didn't. They didn't tell me that. Yeah. You know, Jonah, <laughs> Jonah Bunch. Which, by the way, if y'all don't know Jonah Bunch, y'all should go f uh, follow Jonah Bunch. I, he has a YouTube channel, Bunch's, Bunch's Diesel, per Diesel Performance. Diesel perform yep. Bunch's Diesel Performance, all right? Jonah Bunch is, what's Jonah, man? What is Jonah? About 300? Yeah. Jonah oh, he, about 300. Boy, yeah. But but he ain't, he ain't, no, he, he ain't, ain't the, the soft fat type. Mm -mm. This joker is just a tank. Yeah. Uh, but one of the unique things about Jonah Bunch is he is very innovative. Okay. It, I think that's one of yeah. his biggest strengths. It really is. I mean, if it, now he'll, he will follow. I, I trust Jonah to have enough integrity to follow the rules, but if your rules are not Amen. specific enough, I didn't brief it. It, that's it. <laughs> if your rules are not specific enough say for Jonah you Bunch, can't catch a ride. He is going to find. And here's what a happened. Way. They was out on one because they could walk roads and trails. I, I didn't. You know, it wasn't like selection where you can't walk roads and trails. So I was like, by all means, use roads and trails, especially at night. You know, I don't want you walking off a cliff. But uh, they came out on one of the, one of the fire breaks, and he said, "Some old boy in a pickup drove by." I was like, "What y'all doing?" Well, we we moving that way. Hop in. So they jumped in. Heck yeah, man! They saved them about you know three three to five miles or something. That's like that. nothing so, wrong. Nothing wrong with that, man. Innovation. I'm briefing the next time now, dude. Innovation is a uh, is a a gift uh, that not a lot of people have, but it's well, extremely important. You can call it innovation. Call it problem solving. Uh, that, that, whatever you want to call it. Exactly. Man. So I, I almost yeah. I actually almost got kicked out of the Navy for being innovative oh. during a training, during a training evolution yeah. in seal qualification training. We were in seer school. It's the escape and evade, yeah, right? Yeah. Where you get freaking captured and it, all this. So, um, this was like a urban moving through an urban environment. So we had got captured and then we escaped and so then we have to learn, we have to go out and blend into this urban environment and make our way to, uh, to our, our pickup point. Right. So we're, we're moving through it's, it was actually on base. The urban environment right. was base. Yeah. Right. So when we escape our captors, of course, we're in military uniform. Well, we're, we're briefed on like, okay, you need to blend in well you're not i don't bl i'm not blending in walking around in a pair of woodland bdus yeah and so we're walking we we get out we're walking down this alleyway and there's a a little restaurant on base called the rice king all right little uh chinese place well the rice king in this back alley left one of their windows open uh -oh. 
Okay? <laughs> so we ease on up in through that window into the Rice King, make our way to the locker room of the Rice King, and and change out of these uniforms and pull off the clothes that these Rice King people left in their locker room. And we walk out of there and we bebop down the street like we're just a couple of sailors, you know, out after a drunken night on the, on, on, on base there. And uh, we make it to the E&E point. Well, old, old Rice King calls yeah, Naval Special <laughs> Warfare the next day. Uh, and so then Naval Special Warfare, instead of saying, good job, guys. Me and a couple of my classmates, yeah. good job. You guys were innovative. You saw an opportunity. You went in. You did what you were taught. What you were taught. We didn't break anything. Right, right. Yeah. The yeah. the window was open. Right. Yep. Uh, instead of doing that, naval special warfare, of course, sides with big navy, yeah. throws us slap oh, under man. the bus, and then decides they're going to try to prosecute us for breaking and entering during this training environment and doing what the crap we're supposed to be doing. It literally, it was my last block of SEAL qualification. I was leaving that block to then graduate SEAL qualification training and go to my SEAL team. Yep. And I'm sitting there for two weeks, all the way literally up to a few days before graduation, uh, going through um, captain's mass, going through all this bull crap. They're telling us, no, we're going to kick you out of the Navy. You want to talk about stressed out, man. That was one of the most stressful times in my life. And it actually, it actually, it screwed me up, man, because you know what it did? It, it, it made me have a bad attitude. Yeah. I was, a, I was a kid back then, yeah. man. Yeah. And it made me start to resent yeah. Naval Special Warfare. Like, how are these guys going to throw us? Uh, how how is the head shed here going to side with the freaking Rice King instead of saying Rice King, Rice King, screw you, man. We're training warriors. You yeah. shouldn't left your dang window open. Yeah. How are they going to throw us under the bus and try to kick us out of the daggone Navy and prosecute us? And here we've already went through all of Buds. All, yeah. We've been training for a year. Yeah. And they're going to throw us under the bus. And dude, I got a really bad attitude. Yeah, I can see. It screwed me up, dude. That was probably that was your first taste of uh, understanding that if there's anything about the big military is that they don't care about you as an individual, right? You're as long as you're doing all the right stuff, you're good. If you do anything that makes any wave whatsoever, they don't, they don't care about you. Yeah, you know, but man, you always, you know, until you learned that lesson, yeah. you, you always thought that, okay, man, this is Naval Special Warfare. Like, the 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 people in charge here, obviously, unless we go out and get a, a freaking DUI or right, we do right. something yeah, stupid, yeah, yeah. like, you know, in this scenario, you're thinking, well, surely... The Commodore, surely the Admiral, the, the people who are in yeah. charge of WARCOM are going to stand up for us. Yeah, yeah. No, they bow their knee. Yeah. They, the Naval Special Warfare bowed their knee to to Big Navy uh to 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 keep to to keep themselves clean. And it's interesting about the military, man, is the people who get into those, not all, but some of the people who get into those high up leadership positions, they essentially become politicians. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. And, and they they don't they don't always get there because because their performance was good. They get there because they appeased the right people. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I agree. I, I mean it's it was just it was wild, man. And it put a bitter taste in my mouth. It started my career off in a in a bad bad yeah. way. No, I can see it. Uh yeah. And I agree. All, all I think all these uh these um senior level officers are all just politicians in, in, in development. You know what I mean, that's, that's all they are. Yeah. And there's a lot of politics and I understand all that high level stuff. There's a lot of politics and intact and, and all those things you got to employ. But for a young guy, you know, trying to be a c combat killer, and then you get in trouble for climbing through a window on a square in a school where <laughs> you were taught Yeah, that like do anything you need to do to, yeah. Well, you, I mean, you, 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 I know you understand this stuff. 
on a way deeper level than me. I only, I, I was only an E6 in the Navy. That's the highest rank I got. Yeah. So you went all the way to E9, right? No, E8. Yeah, E8. I, I was a master okay. sergeant when I retired. Okay. Yeah, yep. All right. Yep. So, yeah, I know. And working at SOCOM, I can't imagine the stuff you were. Uh, well, as an E8, you can imagine. I was among the lower ranking dudes walking around. Oh, there. yeah, for yeah. sure. So it was an eye opener. I can't see you being a butt kisser, Edgar. No, I'm not. Well, that's that's why I was an E8 when I retired. <laughs> I didn't want to. Be, well, I, and and the and the truth, I, I I never want to be a sergeant major anyway. Um, team sergeant's the last good job in my opinion, because you're still out there doing the business. You you're responsible for you know eleven other dudes. Uh, you got a fair amount of influence, I'd say. The higher ups listen to you a little bit because you've been around for a minute. Uh, and you still get to go out and and do the thing you know um sergeant major after that once you're a sergeant major you're, you're it's a, that's a staff job even if you got a company you're still it's pretty much still a staff job now that's not to take away from any sergeant major who's been killing combat sometimes you know you want to go out there with the boys and things like that but yeah e is the last good job it ain't the first good job but it's the last good job and it's definitely in my opinion the best job Really? Oh yeah, man. And any young guy who don't want to be a team sergeant, I think he's I don't know. You should want to be in charge of a team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You I think I think you should reach a you should definitely reach a point in your maturity yeah. uh as you progress through your career that you yeah. desire to to lead a team. Yeah, for uh, sure. It may take you a while to get there. Yeah. You know, I, I know for for me when I was active duty in my through my early twenties in the very early part of my career, like half the time, dude, I was just trying to freaking survive and not freaking screw stuff up, yeah. you know? And like, it was, it was really until, until my late twenties, um, late, late twenties, 28, 29 years old that I could even expand my mind enough to think, okay, I can actually have an opportunity to to share with dudes the things I've learned, all the crap I've screwed yeah. up, and I can actually now start thinking about making an impact. Yeah, um, that was a real distinct transition in my mind. It yeah. took me a while to get there. I'm a slow learner, though. Me too. Yeah, you know? <laughs> that was hard. Um, yeah, I think I think as I think it was awesome that you had prior service. A lot of prior. Oh service. yeah, prior to go. Yeah, prior for to, sure. Because that man, you had all this time to mature. Before well, that, <laughs> you say that, um, when I when I was brand new to SF, I was a senior E six already, um, and I was in first battalion, and we were in Afghanistan, and uh, the the my first ever team sergeant was like a twenty year SF guy, and he was what I imagined. He was, he was what I pictured when, when I thought of SF. He retired. And uh, we got a new team sergeant right before we went to Afghanistan. And I went to the 18 Fox course, the Intel course. So they deployed while I was gone. I went on the PDSS before that. But then I was in school when they deployed, and then I linked up with them after school. And uh, once I got over there, man, the whole team was looking at me bright eyed, like, hey, man, you got to do something. This guy sucks. So the team sergeant got fired while in Afghanistan, and I was the next senior guy. I was in SF for like a year and a half, two years. And then I was an E7 team sergeant. Buddy, I wasn't, I wasn't ready for that action at all. I was like, man, hold on. I mean, I, my warrant officer, I was like, Tom and Bud, what, what am I supposed to do? He's like, be a team sergeant. How yeah. how did you navigate that? I mean, how? Well, well, you know, I just did just just did squad leader type stuff, just at a higher level. I'd been a squad leader in eighty second, but now you got higher level guys. So I was hard time navigating, you know, personalities and things yeah. like. I was always a, a confrontational dude. I'm, 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 I was very aggressive in my younger age. You're still pretty aggressive. Yeah. That's okay, Edgar. Uh, I was, it was rough, you know. 
but I stayed, I stayed in for that deployment and then they left me in for a J set to Ukraine. So we, we went over to Ukraine, did great things, you know, whatever. then I, dep- then I went to uh second battalion, you know, PCS after that. But, uh, yeah, it was crazy, man, because not only when I showed up to the team, not only did I have a team sergeant that I imagined I would have, I had two seniors and that's not normal. There was already two 18 Bravos on the team. One of them was getting ready to move somewhere and retire or something. I don't know what, but so I had extra kick in the junk. You know what I mean? I had two guys kicking me in the junk. Yeah. And then uh, all of a sudden they were gone. All the senior guys were gone within like a year of me showing up. Dude, that, but that had to have like forced you to grow. It for, yeah. It on forced such a lot a of stuff. Rapid yeah. rate, man. It yeah. forced a lot of stuff. But then I did not have a good time on my next team because then the team sergeant there I thought was, I happened to think was not a good team sergeant. Um, so I didn't uh, last on that team. I went to, I went to a battalion for a minute and then I took, then I got, well, I'm 88 during that too. So then I went to my, my, my team that I was on, but, um, well, good on you for stepping up to do that, man. I mean, cause well, but here's the thing, uh, the same way I got a mountain team, I go in our sergeant major's office and he's like, Hey, you're taking two, three. And I was like, uh, I'm scared of heights and I'm not mountain qualified. He's like, that's all right. <laughs> Beat You'll it. figure it out. Yeah. I was like, oh. yeah. Yeah, I'm still scared of heights, by the yeah. way. You know, I, I I think I think a lot of people have a perspective that within the special operations community, and, I, and I'm only speaking from my my own personal experience. Everybody's experience is different, right? I think For a lot sure, of people yeah. think that there is just this massive pool of really good, eager, ready leaders to step yeah. into any freaking position yeah, that yeah. needs to be filled that is not how it is man like so my in my first platoon halfway through workup our platoon chief got fired uh and there was and nobody replaced him so we just we just went on through the rest of the work at and, and then went on deployment with without a, and, and a platoon chief is the most integral part yeah of a SEAL platoon. He's the highest ranking enlisted Yeah, person. That, that's the same as a team sergeant okay. on SF team. So I, 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 th- there I was nobody that. to replace him. Yep. A- and and there was there was nobody that really within the platoon that was ready or willing or assigned to step in and fill that role because the yeah. the person behind him, the LPO was a was was you know, I, I, he was doing the best he could. Yeah. We'll just put it at that. And, um, like that. So, so if you think that there's just this so, bunch of people waiting around to step into yeah. a spot, that's not the way it is. So man. here, 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 here's what it is, man. Here's what I think anyway, because I told you guys before, I think I'm a junior psychologist also. Um, everybody sees or all the civilian, everybody on the outside looks in, they see a bunch of physically fit combat dudes who can do you know do all kind of crazy stuff and they're all they're all leaders and they're all this and that and the other but when you're in in the space everybody's got their own little issues you can have the most fit guy the most the most charismatic guy you know and he's a perfect perfect he does everything right and checks all the blocks and that's good and then the guy the dude commits suicide so, I mean, there's all kind of stuff like that, and it's constant. So, leadership, um, generally speaking, I don't think does a good job at, at – I ain't saying you got to you be soft on guys and hug on guys, but, you know, the leadership will stress you out. And, and they do it, whether they mean to do it or not, because they're looking after their own careers. Uh, and, and people who are career guys, and that's their thing, uh, you know, I, I kind of have a distrust for like what I, a careerist. Now, that don't say everybody who's been in the army for twenty years is a bad guy. I'm just saying, I wouldn't consider myself a careerist, and I did twenty five years. Um, but everybody has their chinks in their armor, man. Even the 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 best dudes, you know. Um, 
Now, obviously, you, you got tier one units where the 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 fittest of the dudes, and, and I wouldn't even necessarily say they're all better problem solvers, but definitely the fitter dudes kind of and and it's what is it? They're like less than one percent of SF or or special operations, yeah. something like that. But even then, man, uh, they still. Some, you know, they, they I, all, I agree with they you. They do some weird stuff that has some kind of like legal ramifications, or they'll, or some guy will commit suicide out of the blue, or, or yeah. some. So there's a problem there somewhere. So My, everybody looks good on the outside, um, and the military's done a. They're working on trying to help address mental, you know, issues and stuff like that. But man, I mean, everybody's got their 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 chinks, you know. My so my experience in the in the US Navy was the SEAL team was a bunch of freaking regular dudes. Yeah. That had issues. Yeah. That most of them were a, a lot of them were broken in many yeah. different ways, but they just wouldn't quit. You That's could it. you could yeah, depend yeah, yeah. you could just yeah. everyone there you could just depend on right. them not to quit. Yeah. They didn't know necessarily know how to do the thing yeah. that needed to be done, but somebody was yeah. going to find a way to do it. And well, that's the way the well, ball kept rolling. That's what I see as a common thread in in spe why special operations dudes are special operations dudes. You could probably bro, alcoholism uh just crazy stuff, womanizing, uh, habitual DUI, do you know, like yeah. there's even dudes that were doing drugs and stuff. Oh uh, yeah. But when it came down to it, you could depend on them. They were gonna show up for work and, and they were gonna work and hard. Do the business. Yeah, for sure. Um, so that's what I see as the common thread is what makes special operations in general different. Than that's what makes them special than the regular. Yeah. Yeah. Because regardless, now I can tell you this. One of my best mates, uh, Tommy, he and I were uh, hard drinkers. <laughs> we were stationed in Korea together. Um, bro, we were doing an EMT course, and we showed up to the, that joker every day, jackhammered, buddy. And we both passed the frigging course, How, you know, blacked out drunk. Because we get up and do what we're supposed to do. Yeah. yeah that was it. Yeah, that's it, man. No, I ain't saying that's good, bad, or otherwise. I'm saying you got something. You get up and you got to do it. That's right. Uh, yeah. However hard or, or whatever. Man, that, 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 nail, that nails it. I love that. You you got something to do. You get up and go and do yep, it. No, it doesn't really do it. matter how you feel that day. Yep. You just get up and go and do it. And so I think that's the common thread with, with soft versus versus uh not because a lot a lot of people they don't you know, i don't get paid enough for this or this, you know this and that yeah. and the other. Um, well, soft uh, guys just get up and hustle because of their buddy really or because yeah. of this just i gotta this is what i'm supposed to do I'm doing it that's the expectation yeah yeah all right i want to uh i'm gonna take a little break real quick and then i want to come in edgar and shift the conversation and i want to talk about the libertarian oh wait. party nice all right yeah because I, you know, I would consider myself more bordering along the lines of anarchy or an, an, an anarchist, but I would say I'm close. The closest party that I could be on board with would be a libertarian. But I have also heard a lot of people that comment the reason why the libertarian ideas don't ever gain any traction is because they sound good, but they won't actually work. And so we'll get into that we'll conversation. Into that. Yeah, All right, yeah, let's take a little break. Yeah, YouTube, you guys stand by. We're going to come back. Edgar's going to brief us up on this. Won't <laughs> yeah. put you black and mute, YouTube. Just deal with it.
but I want to have one because uh, I was going to get an SF ring when I retired. Maybe I didn't. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I didn't, but I don't wear rings. You know what I mean? Well, I was like, you know, you don't you don't think about you, at, at least me, anyways, man. Like I remember when we were going through when we went through SQT at SQT graduation, Sig came out and said, yeah. "Hey guys, we're gonna make we're, we're gonna offer you guys um, direct purchase of a Sig P two two six, and we're gonna engrave the Trident Naval Special Warfare on the slide." Like when you're in it, you're like, "Why the crap would I want that, man?" Like you know. And so, luckily, my parents bought one of those. Yeah. Uh, nice. and it's like, it's like the only gun I have now that is just not for sale. Yeah. Cause it's special now, yeah. you know, but you know, that yeah, when you're in, you don't, you, you don't, don't think about that stuff. No, you don't, man. Just like pictures. Yep. I wish I had pictures of more or more pictures. Yeah. I've got very few pictures mm -hmm. of anything <laughs> ever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you don't think about it. You don't think about it. Until you're old and you're like, man, wish I had some pictures. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I got, I have one, I have one photograph of me and my sea daddy, Jake Hubman, who committed suicide in 2012. And he was the dude that Jake was so patient with me, dude. Like I screwed so much stuff up and he was the one that hammered yeah. me. But like one, so I remember one time, just a little story about Jake, just to, to memorialize him for a minute, Jake Hubman. Uh, we were we were doing SALC, which is urban warfare training. Yeah. And um, I in my first platoon, I ran an A dub uh, Mark forty six, which is a five five six caliber belt fed machine gun. Yeah. Um, and I rocked that A dub. I mean, I really loved it. I enjoyed it. Um. But one day we got done doing a run and we were just using blanks because it was, you know, urban training. And, and so, you know, you get, you can get a little lackadaisical using blanks. Yeah. I, I mean, you can get a little complacent. It just, I'll be straight up with you. And so one day we're, we get done with a run and we're all sitting around just debriefing the run that we just did through the little city there. And, uh, I got my A dub, my A dub is sitting to the side, feed trays up. It's clear, right? But I forgot to shift the safety selector to safe. And so Jake sees that. And uh he made a big deal out of that, which he should have. Th that's a big deal, right? So he said, you know what, Chad? You want to be complacent? All right. Well, for the rest of the week, you're going to run from the front gate to our training site here. And it was about four miles from the front gate to the training site. And he said, you're going to run in full kit with your, with your machine gun. So that added like, you know, two hours to my day, my training day, every single day. Um, but you know what he did? He ran it with me every yeah. single day. Cause like he literally he and in his mind, it was partially his fault that I didn't put my safety selector on safe. Yeah. It was partially his fault that I was being complacent because we're out there shooting blanks and we're just doing run after run after run after run. And it's like Stuff like that, man, just stuck with me, dude. Yeah. Like that, 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 that dude did that. I mean, that was like my earliest examples of what it, what it actually looked like tangibly to be a good leader, to be a good mentor. Um, they came from that dude, man. I don't know. I got one picture with him. Me, yeah. I'm standing beside him out on a land warfare range. Yeah. But just speaking of pictures, that's the only, that's probably from my entire time in service. That's the most valuable picture that I have. Yeah. Um, and 
Yeah, there's that's a long that's a long story. We won't go into that. I want to shift the conversation. Yeah, let's do it, man. Let's around do it. Let's uh, do it. this is um, <clears throat> I I don't really I don't know where I want to start with this. To be honest with you, uh, obviously. Are are you happy with the way our government is no, functioning on, here no. in the United States? Don't set me up with a big question <laughs> like that. Obviously not. No. Um, okay. Well, I've always been a, a political skeptic, right? Always. Um, but I can tell you, and there wasn't, I discovered libertarianism probably in, you know, 20, 2010 ish or so had a couple of teammates or, uh, one of my buddies was on the Rand Paul or Ron Paul. Sorry. Um, I started getting curious, but this, uh, the, the withdrawal from Afghanistan was, was a big kick in the junk for every service member ever. In my opinion. Uh, there was a lot of guys in my circle of friends or, or 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 colleagues that were emotionally, visibly emotional about the whole thing, uh, and the partners we built over there just getting left out to hang, and 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 all this and that, um, for political expedience. Now you can argue how many different ways there were were to leave Afghanistan. Well, the way that happened was not the right way. And you can also argue why were we still there. Uh, so I, I latched on to the political, um, the Libertarian Party as as a political identity. You know, if, if people ask about it, I'm, I don't. I'm not a libertarian. I don't walk around wearing my Libertarian T-shirt, but I'm not one to impose my belief system on people. Mm-hmm. But it's the it's the platform that makes sense. It's the platform. I'm not an isolationist either when it comes to the United States. I believe in open free trade, which the Libertarian Party espouses. Uh, also, there's a, a common logo or, or or phrase out there. I'm already against the next war. <laughs> That's not to say there's no such thing as just war. Uh, there, I, I imagine there is. Um, but I can't remember what famous general said it, but war's a racket. Uh, it's always been a racket and always will be a racket. Financial racket. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anybody who believes that we're that we're uh, sending money to Ukraine because of uh, just Russia's evil and Ukraine's good, they're they're confused about that. Same with Israel and Palestine. Whatever side you fall down on, it doesn't matter. You. My point is, uh, we're not compelled to be on anybody's side financially. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, libertarians I like them. So I, I want you to, I want you to kind of just give us the the reasons why you have chosen this, and as you said, as a, a political identity. Uh, what are some of the fundamental aspects of the libertarian party that really look to you like solutions um you know what why have you chosen this as a political identity well <clears throat> i think because as I do, they, as a party, kind of examines everything through the lens of individual liberty. Starts with the individual. And to me, that's very important. That's, we, we've lost our individual identities to all these various labels that are going around these days. So these days, you've got to be in a tribe of some sort. And, you, and if you're in that tribe, you got to be against whatever that tribe's against. But First and foremost, we're all individuals. Uh, and from the Christian point of view, God ain't going to save this tribe over this tribe. Right? You're, you're responsible to accept Jesus and all that stuff, correct? Mm -hmm. Just because your, your crew did it don't mean you're, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. We're individuals. Um, and yes, if a group of individuals are acting in a uh, common 
for a common goal, that's fine. But that that group shouldn't necessarily define you, right? You're still an individual. You're individually responsible for your own actions and all those things. Mm -hmm. So the Libertarian Party kind of, they start, they look through the lens of individual freedom. So does a thing violate my individual freedom? Does a law, a proposed law, violate, first of all, my individual freedom? And if the answer is yes, then that's it. Don't take no further steps. It's no good. Mm -hmm. Never mind does, okay, so uh, tax money, right? Obviously, taxation is theft, right? Well, side note, well, no, finish, and I want. I will get into taxes in a little bit. Yeah, but we have no say in where our tax money goes. That's right. You know, anywhere from twenty to you know forty percent of our money goes to the government in some big magical pot that goes out to. Uh, I would say closer to sixty if you calculated everything. Yeah, right. Um, with sales tax and and mm -hmm. uh, the whole works. So we're we're working to. Uh, in the army, we call it the self licking ice cream government exists to sustain itself these days and the libertarian perspective of the government is it should exist to protect individual rights to enforce contracts individual right as an individual if you and i go into a contract together and one of us violate that, that the government's job is to arbitrate that and then provide uh well, by virtue of protecting individual rights, there should be some aspect of law enforcement. Now, look, man, I got a love-hate relationship with the cops, you know. Uh, there needs to be some law and order. But if you look at the amount of laws that are on the books, and they could it's, probably it's be freaking reduced, dangerous. probably be reduced by 80%. It's dangerous. At man. least. Well, you, you understand why there are so many laws on the books. Well, yeah, well, it's all. It's so that anyone at any time can be incriminated. Right. I wish I remember who said it, but there was somebody, and it's like you can wake up and go about your daily business and violate eight laws a day. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, just by getting up and going to get breakfast, you know, go go to the gym, whatnot. So, yeah, there's too many laws. That doesn't mean cops have to violently enforce those laws, but, um, so yeah, libertarians are are all about a. Uh, to oversimplify it is is don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. That's that's their little easy catchphrase. Don't hurt other people and don't take their stuff. Um, the platform based around it. So, you, well, that's very simplistic. And what about foreign policy and all this stuff? Foreign policy, well, free trade. So who do we have embargoes against? Cuba, for instance. We don't want to trade with Cuba because they're bad and evil. Well, meanwhile, politicians are smoking Cuban cigars, but never mind that. Uh, Cuba's bad and evil. We don't want to trade with them, so we're going to block them off. Uh, is Saudi Arabia, what have they got going on? Are they are they benevolent, good, angelic? Uh, their government's all dem democratic and all that? No, oh, man, they're still over there chopping people's arms off and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But we'll trade with them. Yeah. Because there's a strategic reason to trade with them. Yep. So if you take the morality out of the out of the whole thing, and just strictly on financial grounds determine who we're going to trade with or not, that'll take a lot of people throw their own morality in there. Well, yeah. Who's to who is to determine who is who, right. who is good and who is bad? Because if you ask, uh, let's see, there's a there's a probably a pretty good say. I don't know what the percentage is a segment of the population in America that are. Uh, Muslim, they they probably don't got no issue. Well, never mind the problems within the Muslim cultures, uh, which countries hate which countries for whatever tribal reasons also. But if you take the morality out of it and you just, okay, let's, let's look at foreign trade through an economic spectrum. Uh, free trade would, would benefit us. Um, when we tax our own goods, and then we give tax breaks to foreign entities. That's no good, right? So, uh, a, a libertarian platform is kind of against tariffs and, and things like that. More open free trade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I kind of disagree with open border policies. Libertarians kind of have a, depends on which libertarians you ask, but much like every other political entity, there's there's little factions within. Um, I belong to the, the, the Mises caucus, and uh, Mises was an a Austrian econo e economist, um, and I'm not an econ economist in any, I can barely do math. But another one of my teammates turned me on to, he said something about Keynesian economics. I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. He looked at me like I was dumb, so I had to go research um, and looked at Keynes versus Mises as far as economics go. And the no-brainer <laughs> is, is, is uh, von Mises. Von, von Mises. Um, free trade. Yep, I like that. Borders, I, I think, I, I don't, as far as immigration goes, I'm not against it. But we need to know who's in the country and, and how many because that's how our, our, our census counts how many votes are given to any given state based on the number of humans. So if we just have open borders, we don't really have a good election system based on the number of, of votes that get dished out, right? Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, I, I because think— Because if you go do a head count from the census, you're just doing a head count. Whether they're friggin' uh, citizens or not yeah. is irrelevant to them. So— Well, I, I you know, you talk—I think there are so— uh, that Yes, that is an issue with open borders, but I, I don't even think that— like fundamentally, a nation cannot even exist without. Well, it's not a sovereign nation it, without borders. Without borders, right? like no, yeah, that's right. Um, when when we when we if you look back historically, the the collapse of empires, uh, a big thing that played into the collapse of of most empires is the fact that they reached a point that they could no longer maintain their yeah. borders. Yeah. And so they they were just they they were slowly yeah. over time taken over and collapsed internally be, by if if we look at, at the example of what the Roman Empire by what they called barbarians anyone who wasn't Roman the Roman Empire had expanded so so far so yeah. vast that they could yeah. no longer maintain their borders and yeah. so if you have a a nation who cannot maintain the border then that nation will will be overrun no it's yeah by barbarians it's no longer it, you can no longer define it exactly borders define citizenship what's the point of being a citizen if we have open borders there there's no there's no benefit of citizenship so you're kind of crapping on the american citizen when you when you advocate for just wide open no uh no control borders yeah, I, I believe we should let immigrants into our country, but yeah, there's one a of the, process one for of the that. only jobs that Congress is is mandated to do is to regulate immigration. That they just f re refuse to to take a stand on that, um, because America was built on immigrants. Okay, I, I agree with that, um, but that don't mean you just got to kick the door open and hope that they all come to your district. So you can get votes. Yeah. Which it leads us to the question, is it by design and all this and that? Uh, so, yeah, I don't necessarily agree with open borders, but I do agree with with strong immigration. Um, used to, you know, there was a kind of a conditional. We we look for the, the best and brightest from other countries to come here. Because that benefited, that benefited America. Now um, we're looking for uh, voter rolls. Mm-hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. So if they can get as many um, uh, immigrants in here as possible, be there to greet them and put them on a voting, put them on their voting rolls, and they're good to go. While, while we're discussing the topic or, or, or just scratching the surface of the topic of voting, do you think that our elections still have integrity? Do you, do you think that we oh. have election integrity? <laughs> I don't think our elections were ever okay. rock solid. Now, I think there's probably been voter fraud since since the get-go, but mm -hmm. um, now everything is just becoming evident uh, because of the internet and because of the, the so, amount of people who are out to get uh, watchdogs, if you will. Yeah. yeah. So, so what, what, what is your, 
what is your take on voting? Well, my take is that local elections are more important than national elections. And ours is coming up on Tuesday, by the way. Um, I believe that the sheriff is pro- should be one of the most important figures voted for in your county. Because I also believe that no matter what happens nationally, if they pass some bullcrap unconstitutional law, all the sheriff has to do is go, no, we're not enforcing that. Carry on. Mm-hmm. Uh, if the federal government decides to make example and send an army of federal agents and or troops to dispute that sheriff's sovereignty, that would be such a, I mean, we're already living in 1984 Orwell, you know what I'm saying? That would go well beyond what I even think the, the, the progressives are willing to do. Mm-hmm. Well, they're willing to, but the optics of it would be too bad for them, and it would the backlash would be insane. So yeah, so yeah, I think I think voting for a sheriff, and I think having a sheriff with integrity and and big balls mm-hmm. uh, is more important than who you vote for on a national election. Okay. Well, yep. do do you would you still advocate for participating in national elections? Do you, yeah, I do. do. You think there's I value vote, in yep, that? I vote every time, and I vote libertarian every time. <laughs> I know ain't, it ain't going to happen. I'm just trying to put numbers on the board, bro. Uh, yeah. If, you know, if, because, because largely, and I hate to, I'm not shitting on the American public. Sorry. Uh, I'm not crapping on the American public, but, you know, we're very much team. Everybody's divided up into their teams, man. You got the red team and the, and the blue team. No matter who's on the ticket, they're going to go blo- vote for their team whether that person's been indicted for bribery or for whatever, it doesn't matter. That's their guy. Uh, people don't think on an individual level, their team, it doesn't matter to the Democrat party, the guy you vote for. It doesn't matter. The platform is the platform. So I'm voting for a platform, not a dude or, or a lady. I voted for Joe Jorgensen. I voted for, uh, I voted for doggone, uh, old Gary, um, I can't remember his name now. He he did the Aleppo thing. Uh, they, somebody asked him about Aleppo during the campaign, and he was like, "I don't know what Aleppo is," and that was it. <laughs> well, but he's a cyclist, you know. Anyway, well, um, would you would oh, over overall this uh, the the Libertarian Party? Is would it be a true statement to say that they they are advocating for or believe in much smaller federal government? Absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. So, it, like, down to what point? Like, like, are we talking like well, a skeleton that's, crew? Or that's like, where you get that's where you get the different factions. Um, you got you got some that that think we can, the libertarians can can change things from within. So the federal structure, one realistically, you're not. We're probably never going to change the federal structure. I mean. It's a good structure, by the way. I don't think it needs changing structurally. I, I, I think the individuals... Now, a lot of people don't know this, um, but Ron Paul is a big figure in the Libertarian Party. Um, he happened to be, happens to disagree with um, term limits. I mean, he happens to disagree that term limits need to happen he thinks term limits are uh, that wouldn't make any effect whatsoever i disagree with that yeah i think term limits would be a a start the way you amass all these these politicians that are there for decades the way they amass so many little secrets and and favors is over time man yeah yeah if you're only there for four years there's only so many secrets and and favors you can amass before you're out of there mandatorily. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Well, what if this guy's really good? Well, if he's really good, he can mentor another guy who, can, if he can get the votes, he gets the votes. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah. so, but, but like I said, individually, it, it probably don't matter that much. I think, I don't know, probably Nancy Pelosi is one, probably one of the most corrupt, uh, uh, uh senators. I, 
in office? What if she what if she retired today? Would there be a stand up, you know, person take her take her spot? Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> probably probably yeah. not. So I I'm, mean uh, yeah, the 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 level of the level of corruption within the federal government is it is it is absolutely astounding. Yeah. When when you when you hear of it, you almost can't believe it. It's so astounding. I I just heard today, uh, I was listening to the Sean Ryan show, and he has a he has a, a female CIA targeter uh, that was involved in in uh, in in Benghazi and, and all that around 2012. And yeah. she's in there just, you know, spilling the beans. And she's talking about, I heard today, she was talking about Hillary Clinton as the secretary of state would not meet with leaders of other nations as the secretary of state, unless that leader of the other nation made a donation yeah. to the Clinton Foundation. Yeah, I can see that. That that is that's you can't even make that up. Yeah, I can see that. Well, that's the that that's it. Right? Um let, let's take a big leap. Um a, a lot of the progressives these days will openly tell you they are so democrat socialists. Well, the next step from socialism is communism. Socialism thought even a thing. It, yeah. It's just a it's, it's just, just a step. Yeah, that's right. Um, but there's there's people in charge. Even though you think everything's getting distributed equally to all the, the people, the people, there's still somebody in charge. And that person in charge is still driving around in a two hundred thousand dollar car. And that person in charge is still gonna have stocks that you ain't you don't have. Uh, or insider information that you don't have. They're still going to be an elite class, even with even with communism. Oh yeah. So I don't know what they're fighting for on that. <laughs> well, we got starving, homeless, and hungry. There's that's that's going to be the case, unless the government is it the government's job to make sure you're not homeless. I, I don't think it is. However, there's millions and millions going to campaign funds. Uh, I would say bi- speaking, I would say billions. Speaking of, speaking of Clinton, let's go back to uh, Haiti. All the all the relief funds that was raised for Haiti. Haiti should be a goddamn utopia right now, <laughs> right? But yeah, it, I don't even know what that number would be. There's nothing different. There's nothing, nothing. different right nothing. now. Nothing. So until and and I'm I'm banging on the 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 left, but the right is is equally as bad as far as insider trading and capitalizing on, on, on information and contracts from the military uh, or for the military through name it, you know, Lockheed, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, uh, most famously Dick Cheney and, and Kellogg Brown and Root who made all the money in the nineties and, and, uh, you know, Bosnia and all that stuff. Um, until these people are held accountable, so they, they stand in front of a judge and are held accountable f- for these. Are, are they crimes? There's some insider trading is a crime. To, to, to say a politician, when a politician proposes a law that benefits the company that their husband just dumped $10 million into, we, we, that's insider trading, man. Uh, there's no yeah. way around it. So until these people start getting held accountable for any kind of criminal activity whatsoever i think i think there should be criminal charges brought um on the whole afghan withdrawal that was negligent uh uh i get you know is negligent homicide i don't know how many people died for that Uh, that, how many americans died uh, but never mind the the number of afghan commando or or, or partners yeah yeah i mean you 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 talk you talk about you talk about insider trading that's like a misdemeanor yeah yeah Yeah. compared to what what some of uh, of these individuals yeah. who are placed in in elected yeah. office are guilty we are talking about literal crimes against humanity yeah. I, I mean what what is it okay what what is it when you force the population to to take an ins- experimental drug yeah. that then goes on to affect yeah. 
a large percentage of those individuals' health for the rest of their life, yep. and some of them, it even kills them. What the crap, man? But, that is, that is, that is, uh, yeah. But look who owns the Justice Department right now. No, well, well, nothing's going to happen. That, you're exactly right. Nothing's going to happen. Um, so, so how, I mean, what, how, how, in what scenario, yeah. other than an all out revolution, would these individuals ever be placed in a position to where they are actually held accountable? Because they're, like you said, the, the, the condition of the justice system that it's in right now, it's in no condition to hold anyone accountable because it, they're all in league. They're all yeah, they're all in league. Uh, there's a word that floats around in the military a lot called integrity. And until there, there's some saying out there, man, I wish I could remember all these quotes because I see them all the time. Uh, people who seek to be in charge aren't worthy of being in charge. People who don't seek to be in charge are the people you want in charge. That's a hard one. Yeah. Uh, so all these people that run for office, were they ever, did they ever have integrity? Who knows? Man. Chili says that all the time. When, when yeah. they were young, did they have integrity? And then somewhere during law school, because most of them are lawyers. Do they, where do they get the bug for this power? At what point did they get poked? Or is it family legacy? Like the, the Clintons or the Kennedys with their, their, the, or the, the Bushes or the Bushes with legacy. It's just assumed like I'm, I'm just, a, you know what I mean? Until people with integrity start holding critical offices, that's one thing. Um, and I don't want anybody to think that I'm talking about it's rich versus poor. I used to think that when I was a teenager. And the rich get rich, the poor just get crapped on. And, and that's kind of true. Uh, but however, it ain't rich versus poor. It seems that way. Um, what it is is people who want to run your life versus people who don't. There are plenty of rich dudes out there that ain't trying to impose their will on you. That don't want you to take a shot if you don't want to take a shot. There are plenty of rich folks out there doing that. Plenty of rich folks out there giving the worthy charities um, that ain't trying to to tell you how to live your life. Providing hundreds of thousands of jobs right. for, for, for millions yeah. of people. So yeah. it ain't rich against poor. It's people who want to impose their will versus people who want to let you be. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's where I see that in the bigger, like most general terms. As far as the Libertarian Party, they think that way, right? We just want to take over and leave you alone. That's one of the things they say all the time. <laughs> take over and leave you alone. Let you do what you mm -hmm. want to do. Mm -hmm. What 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 are the things that matter, right? You can't go around murdering nobody. Uh, if you enter into a contract, honor the contract. The Ten Commandments are a great place to Ten, start if perfect, you want to look yeah. at what matters. Yeah. Now, most, well, not most, a lot of libertarians are, are will we'll say they're atheist or, or not. Now, I, I think I said this before. I'm a, I'm a, I follow Ayn Rand and I believe in the philosophy of objectivism. And she, she was an atheist uh, and she didn't believe in altruism in any form she felt like the people who did good things did them out of uh, a bit of selfishness. And that's kind of true. Um, I think when you, when you help somebody out, when you give a, a bum a, a sandwich or, or give them a ride, you know, to the laundromat or something, you feel good about yourself when you do it. Right. And some people do it just for that uh, instead of a general, but when when a, when you help somebody else out, out, it it helps you, and it helps people in that that circle of influence. Yeah, it, for whatever the community. Reason. Right, if, it helps if, the community. If, if the community That's is right. impacted, yeah. in a positive way, you are impacted That's in a right. positive way. So you can call that selfish if you want to. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, that's just semantics on on the reason you did the thing, whether you did it to feel good about yourself and to help the community or whether you did it because you think that uh, it's what God wants you to do. It, you still did the thing and the thing still had a positive impact. So I always, as an adult, I've always hated selfish people. Always. Um, it burns me to the core to see a selfish man do a thing Something as simple as 
when your team comes from training and there's stuff coming off the truck and some dude runs to the shower real quick. Burns me up. Well, we see it all the time. Or in something our, in as our selfish. Training. People don't understand that. As a man who will uh, take take something, take food over his over his kid. You know what I mean? Like he'll he'll get a thing and 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 not not provide for the kid first. You know what I mean? Things like that. Mm-hmm. But I, I agree with Ayn Rand's version of of I do things because yeah, I think that's the the Jesus thing to do. Uh, but I also do it because the the bum you help out on the street, maybe you stopped him from committing suicide that day. You know what I mean? That that dude could go on to be a friggin' go on to be a great human. He might be somebody's dad or something. So he might benefit hundreds of lives. He might go on to be a school teacher and and touch yeah. people. There's a, there's a million things. You know, you don't know what's going on in people's lives. Why you do things, good things is kind of, to me, sort of a semantic, whatever, as long as you're doing good things, <laughs> doing bad things. That's a whole nother subject. We got to talk about that. But from the libertarian perspective, whether you do it because of your, your, your selfishly helping yourself in your community, is that bad? No. Or what are you doing it? Because that's what Jesus would do. And you want to do that. It's still helping yourself and your community mm-hmm. and someone else. So um, I think the libertarians have the right answer on whether they, whether you arrive to that answer by different means, you still get to the right answer. Um, and the government's role in life is to make sure people ain't murdering each other and to protect individual rights. That's it. Yeah. Could... I I guess my, I would, could that not be accomplished simply with, with government on the state, state and local level? I think so. Oh yeah. I think so. That's the thing, man, because I I go to the extreme on this stuff. Um, Like I personally, I personally don't believe there is any, and, and I don't think there's any, um, justification for federal government whatsoever uh but i go to the extreme on this i mean if 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 there if if there need if there is a federal government whatsoever it, i mean it needs to be a skeleton crew and the people who are in the positions yeah. holding positions within that federal government need to be shaking in their boots yeah. afraid that they're going to screw something up or do yeah. something selfish, uh, right. yeah. uh, and 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 get took out back and hung for it. Okay, but I, I just I don't. I mean, I go as far as to say I don't even I don't even believe I don't believe that a a, a standing army is is even necessary. I I I could see the defense of this continent being being upheld by individual state militias who are allied with the states around them instead of having a standing army that's controlled by the federal government, which is nothing but the world's police. Yeah. That's it. That's all it is. And So, so how do we eliminate that? We have every single state in, we can still call this the United States. We can still be in union with one another. Yeah. But every single state maintains their their militia, and if somebody wants to come up in here, well, that's. Uh, I mean, I don't disagree with you. That's sort of a, a utopian. It sounds so extreme, of, man. The best arguments for what you're saying can be found prior to the founding of our country, when they were arguing over uh, becoming a. A federal, you know, the Federalist Papers, for instance, yep. and they were arguing because the arguments against were strong, and they hold true, and and they're and everything that they argued against has come true. And exactly, that, look what that, it's yeah, led us. Everything to. that that's the thing. Every argument ha- has come true. Um, even right in the Constitution, uh, everything it was explicitly stated. I want to say by Thomas Jefferson that like we don't. 
I'm, I'm paraphrasing, obviously. We don't need a list of rights that are to be upheld or are not violated. No rights should be violated. Why should that be on a piece of paper? That's just going to become a list of things that now we have have to fight for. Now we have to fight for our rights that are explicitly listed in, in this document. Um, so the Constitution, even though it was a genius piece of, of work, there were opponents of the Constitution that did not want to create one big federal government. They wanted every state to be autonomous. Yeah, yeah. But, and in the and, and in the in the early days, every every as state colonies. thought of themselves, but even as states, yeah. in the beginning, every state viewed themselves yeah. as a literal sovereign entity. And that's that's the way it was meant to be. Even under the constitution, that's the way it was meant to be. The federal government has taken so much ground that they <laughs> weren't that they weren't explicitly given. They've just taken it. People have gone along with it and not challenged it. And so now every state is beholden to federal government based on money. Every state wants the, the federal money because the, somehow the federal government, let's call it 1913, created Federal Reserve and, and IRS. And now the federal government gets all our money. The yep. state gets a little bit, but the federal government gets it all and then, and then sprinkles it back to the states as, they, as the states comply with whatever yep. nonsense so yeah, it's it's gotten out of control. It's gotten sideways, and I don't think realistically though there's always it's always going to be the structure that it is. Um, I think the only realistic way to make it change is that people are held accountable for crimes. That somehow, some way, all these law one all these agencies don't need to exist, but the Justice Department falls under the executive branch. And whoever's appointed, these are appointees, and the heads of these places are appointees. Nobody's elected them. They're not yeah. hired based on merit. They're appointed based on political affiliation. Yeah. And that's it. And that's got to change. The Justice Department, if anything, should, I, I don't know how much sense it makes for it to fall under the uh, judicial branch, but. Why not? Uh, I I don't know. Something that's less bias. I'd say the Supreme Court, even though they're appointees as well, they're still somewhat fairly balanced. Uh, somewhat. But to appoint a new guy every time a new a new administration takes over, that makes that that makes no sense. I'm just putting in the guy that's going to do what I want him to do. Yeah. Whereas that wouldn't be the case if it fell under a judicial branch, for instance. Yep. Yep. Um, I, I don't know how to to solve this appointee problem, this bureaucrat problem. That's the problem. The elected officials officials are only the wee part of the bigger machine that whenever your guy gets voted out of office and then another guy gets voted in, the majority of those staffers are still the same. This guy will bring a few of his head people with him, but the rest of them are all the same. I think I They're think entrenched. Yeah, and and I think that that's a you you kind of said a key phrase right there, which makes makes determining like a plan of action or or even coming up with a solution to the problems that we are facing as a nation so convoluted is the fact that. It is such a massive machine. Yes. It's, like, it's you know, Chili mentioned it the other day on the podcast. Like, okay, man, well, who do you go after? Like, who who you going to go after? Yeah. And it's, it's... Me and my wife have this conversation. I heard that. I, I listened to that podcast. Um, And I, I, don't, I ain't trying to get nobody arrested or shut down here. But if certain people fail to exist anymore, key people... Who, which, who are the key people? Which ones matter? Because like I said a little while ago, you, if Nancy Pelosi goes away, you're going to get a, you know, Gavin Newsom. Exactly. Uh, if Mitt Romney goes away, <laughs> you get a, a Liz Cheney. What difference does it make? That's just a different face. Mm -hmm. The machine is still the machine. Yes. So who, yeah. who, 
How do you, how do you fix it? I mean, you can't go after a person. You exactly. Got, it's a system. It's the system. It's, it's, and it's, it's massive, yeah. man. Now I got a few key points that I think I've, I've, and I've, I've, I've worked on these for a while. I shared them with my good buddy, Dan Regi. He was, he was one of my uh, senior echo and a good homie. Um, he's a libertarian. <clears throat> and we talked about some things. I think, I think term limits is, is one, one spot. Uh, campaign finance. Um, needs to be fixed. These super PACs need to not exist. Well, yeah, yeah. I, and I think primarily the reason for that is so that any citizen could have, I, I mean, any credible well, citizen. Here's my next point on okay, that. Okay, thank Cam you. Campa campaign fine is that it caps at 2000 bucks. Yeah. I don't care if you're Lockheed Martin or Chad Wright. 2000 bucks is what you can give to this person. That's yep. it, and that's all. Um, and if during campaign time somehow you get a brand new, you know, SUV, that needs to be accounted for. How you got it? Um, I don't. I can't. I can't go out here and buy a freaking pencil on my on on my business account without it being accounted for. Exactly. Um, I don't believe elected politicians or their staff. Now this borderlines on on individual rights, but I don't believe elected politicians or their staff should be able to trade on the stock market because they, that, that, that would literally, that's common. That yeah. is common sense. Yeah. The, the elected official or their staff or their immediate family. Um, now you're like, well, you're, you're, you're taking a private citizen, taking their ability to, to do, Hey, that's, if you're going to go for public office, when to you me, that's enter the public yeah. office, that's the price you pay. That's I, exactly that. right. You can resume trading after you're out. Yeah. But while you're in, your immediate family and your staff. When you when you enter yeah. service in the military, right. guess what? You don't have the same rights no, that's right. as a private citizen. Um. And I'm a, I'm a Rand Paul or Ron Paul. Uh, I believe that the IRS should be abolished completely. Now, let's say, well, that's that's a bridge too far. We should we should flatten the tax code completely. I I don't know if you remember Herman Cain in the seven 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 plan. But, I remember Herman, but I didn't know yeah. that seven 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 plan. Yeah, something like seven percent, you know, federal uh, sales, all and that's it. Period. So if I'm making ten thousand dollars a year and I'm on poverty, I'm still paying seven percent, which is if I make twenty million dollars a year, I pay seven percent. Yep, that's a significant chunk oh, of money. You mean you you mean coming up with a with with some sort of tax system that you can actually freaking understand? For, yeah, and account for. And now, oh man! Now already Why would you do that. Already the vast the millionaires and billionaires pay the vast majority of tax. They evade a lot of tax and good on them for it. I wish I could evade tax. I just don't know how. I ain't got a lawyer to help me do it. Uh, I wouldn't pay a dime if I could get away with it. Um, but if the, if there's got to be a tax, it, it, it yeah, a friggin' eleven grade eleven eleventh grade dude should be able to open the tax code, and it should be about that big, like a little workbook. Open it up and go, yep, yep, this, this is what I owe. Boom, and be yep. done with it. Yep. And instead of paying, yeah, somebody thousands of yeah. dollars a year you just to get, just you to get keep, a little card in the mail keep you from going out of business to say hey it's tax tax time here's the brackets pay pay what you owe uh anyway flatten the tax code fix the tax code i believe the tax i believe the income tax not income tax irs if that was if that was completely squished down there would be no more loopholes there would be no the the amount of money that would it would come in would would be astronomical, I believe. Even with a even with less percentage. I, I see I see exa I know. I, I've thought you the just same thing. Take the loopholes out. I, I've thought the same thing. Um and then check this out. Now this one's a little extreme, but we've got PBS and NPR, those are public, those are public, allegedly public uh services. I don't believe that any campaign should be able to purchase any airtime on anything. Every campaign, 
I don't care from libertarian all the way to whoever the two top dogs are. She get equal amount of time on public <laughs> access. Mm -hmm. PBR, uh, P PBS and uh, uh, NPR. Why? Why? Why do you say that's extreme? That is that. Well, that's that's common. That would you. be a common sense policy. Yeah. Because that would take the a lot of the money out of this campaign stuff. Yeah. Um. So or, if everybody or, gets or, equal or, time, or how about if you're if you want to run a campaign, how about you put in the freaking work and come and sit in here on the three right. seven podcast? Yeah. Um. But would you give every candidate equal time though? So that's what I'm saying with public TV and radio. They're public. They have a time slot. They have a, that's it. You're, yeah. You're, these are public officials. You're a public uh, asset. Yeah. Here's, you know, this is political season. Everybody gets an equal amount of time. That's it. And, and, and as far as debates go, you know, the, the DNC and the, and the RNC, they all have these weird rules that keep third party out of debates. Um, that that should be leveled. It may seem silly, but uh, old Vermin Supreme should be able to get on there and debate with with Joe Biden. You know who? You know Vermin with the guy with the boot on his head? No, no. And that's comical, but he's a he's a he's a famous, well known libertarian guy, and he's comical and he's and he's bizarre. But if he ran for president, he should be able to get on there and answer the same question to. The, the the PBS guy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as Donald Trump. Yeah, I, I agree. I, that, and however bizarre and however much time that takes, <laughs> whatever, man, if they can get on the ballot, what does it cost? A couple grand to get on a ballot. I mean, it's something it's not as long as you're a citizen, you're over 35 or whatever it is, whatever the, 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 the um, requirements for, for, for president are. Yeah. A lot of people meet those requirements, but then, it's a money game. They, you got to get that out of it to to make it a, a truly equitable. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then if the money was not in the game, then you would see the people who didn't who were seeking profit and power, they would start to drop off. Yeah, because it's not worth their effort and time to go chase this thing to where they can't any longer trade stocks and and all this stuff. So you'd start, I think you'd get more quality, more people with more uh, integrity uh, running for office. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I mean, I think people who, if, if there's such a thing, people who genuinely care about yeah. Yeah. their nation, yes, you would get more yeah. people like that, right? Yeah. Um, man, all of this sounds great, Edgar. You know, one, wonderful points, by the way. I, I think awesome points. It, it all it all sounds great, but I personally just I, I just cannot see a way that that is ever yeah, yeah, the, yeah. E even <laughs> even a few of those things that 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 those that, that those things are ever going to actually happen. No, I agree. They're not going to happen. I just don't see a way, man. So, so what in the crap do we do? Uh, that, that, that's the, that's the, the question. Every, everybody, you, you know, people are right now, people are so, people need leadership. Most yeah. people need leadership and they're hungry for it, man. They just want somebody to, to, to to step up and and lead this thing in the in the way that we all not all but I would say the majority see we've we've been we've been duped into thinking that we people the people american people who believe in life liberty and pursuit of happiness who believe in the constitution uh who believe in freedom We've been duped into thinking we're the minority. I don't believe that we are the minority. I believe that we are still the majority. And I believe, I believe through 2020 and 2021, I believe that woke millions of people up yeah. in, in, in a, in a significant way. Yeah. And 
the numbers have increased. Uh, that was a huge shift, man. A huge shift. Yeah. And so I think the majority is there, but there's, 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 there's no leadership and position to move things forward in that direction. And I cannot see a way for leadership to get into that position to move things forward in the right direction without some level of violence. I, I just, I, I cannot picture it. Well, I mean, what's the impetus? What's going to cause the violence? People, I, I, I got buddies that talk about this stuff a lot. I, by the way, that's not what I want. No, that would be apps like you don't know how painful that would be, right. listener. You you think that that sounds like fun? No, man. You're talking no. about your kids being hungry. You're talking about people that you love dying yeah. from starvation and sickness and being killed, and it, it would be ugly, man. Uh, people, um, fortunately especially combat veterans and, and especially guys who who did combat a lot are intimate with violence and the results of violence and and most Americans don't understand don't do not understand what 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 happens the 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 death and destruction and the, and the pain and agony and the chaos and all those things most of Americans, they talk big junk about revolution and all this stuff. You don't want to be out there shooting another American and killing families and this and that and the other in the name of politics. You think you do, but you don't. Um, if you think you get, you know, what kind of was a revolution like? We're all going to band together and march on the Capitol and, 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 what lynch politicians or something? I, what does it look like exactly? Um, yeah. And what's the impetus? What what's the spark that's going to kick it off? I mean, even back during the Revolutionary War, man, it 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 was years built up before it actually kicked off. Years of build up. Yeah. Um, and not to say we ain't been building up for years. We have, but. Uh, People need to really, really critically examine that before they think that just because you got a bunch of guns in your basement and a bunch of ammo don't mean nothing. Uh, you need to think of, of what a revolution looks like. Um, most people I know are sane, right? They have guns for defense, right? They're just going to defend their home, stand tall. Uh, I ain't bugging out nowhere if it goes down. I'm staying in my house and I'm going to, that's what, shoot deer and, Turkey and uh, well, and 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 and, and, out. and re rely on the people around rely you. Rely on my neighbors. Yeah. yeah. Um. And 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 so that's a that's a way of saying rely on your community. <laughs> I know my neighbor as me and him are we're going to be good to go. I know it. Um. But what about the neighbors down the street? I don't know them as well, but I know them. Uh. So, you know, magnify that just a little bit. Well, what about, you know, what about my community? What about S Southwest Rome right there in Lindale? Do I know? Well, yeah, I know a lot of people. So, all right. Politically, why don't I just be active in, the, in that voting for council members and this and that and the other? And that, that's, that's what I think the answer is. The, the the tides are going to ebb and, and flow of national level politics. They're going to, it'll go back to some other way. There'll be a, a um, Republican wave or something will happen and people will complain. The left will think the world's ending and the right will be like, oh, this is it. Um, but politicians in general are always going to step on your rights, whether it's got to do with finances, trading, guns, uh, uh, illegal surveillance, which has been going on at least since 2001, hasn't it? Yeah. From on, a Republican. Uh, on a level that we can't even comprehend. Yeah, by a Republican. Yeah. So, 
it's always going to suck for us as individuals. Well, it's I, just how's it going to suck? What flavors the suck going to be? So you know, you know, keep man, your community strong. Yeah, I, I I agree with that. Um, I I also I don't think that we consider we consider it enough or have the conversation enough that I would say one of, if not the biggest things that got us to this point that we are at right now, which is definitely by far the worst political national environment that, that I've ever experienced in, in my life. Um, one of the biggest contributing factors is that we, the citizens of the United States, have for decades just chosen to be less and less involved, to care less and less about our communities, um, about the laws, rules, and regulations that do infringe upon our liberty. In other words, we've, we, we've just, we've just said, you know what, whatever, do whatever you, as long as you let me stay relatively comfortable, whatever you guys are doing, just, just do it. Right. And so, and also we have, we have for generations chosen to neglect ourselves individually the the standards that we hold ourselves to physically mentally spiritually have just have just degraded to the point that it, it it's it's freaking sad dude it's absolutely yeah. sad uh we said many times here on the podcast the the smallest and I would say the most, the smallest and the most important form of government is the, the family, the yeah. family. It's, it's got, 100%. it's got to start there. And you as the leader of your family, are you freaking fat, lazy, watching porn every day, uh, have no skills whatsoever, nothing, no, no value that you can add to the community that you live in, no value that you can bring to bear because you've chosen to get some stupid freaking job or degree in basket weaving and sit on your butt and play video games and watch freaking porn all day and, and totally neglect any idea of, of faith, anything that challenges you physically, mentally, and spiritually, and you've just degraded to this shell of this piece of crap human. And, and that has over the course of probably what the last three or four decades, it's just progressed our standards for ourselves, especially as men have gotten to the point that we are just a freaking shell of what we should be. What the crap is wrong with us? And, and I, I, I almost, you want to talk about an actionable step. Like what, what is the step? For you, viewer, to watch, or for, for you, viewer, to, to take, the first step is squaring yourself away and then squaring your family away and then teaching others to do the same thing who are in your vicinity, who you can impact. Square yourself away fit physically, mentally, and that, when I say physically, you understand that. When I say square yourself away mentally, that means learn to freaking think. That means learn and learn skills, get skills, have, have a trade, have something that you can bring to bear that adds value. Challenge yourself on those levels. You shouldn't, you should never stop training and learning. Never. Period. And spiritually, you need to get into the word of God because it is the ultimate, the ultimate blueprint for how we can live our lives and function 
not only individually, but as a family unit and also as a community. It literally, anything you want. You want to learn how to manage your finances? It's in there. You want to learn about work ethic? It's in there. You want to learn about how you should treat people? It's in there. Anything you want. It's the ultimate blueprint. So you don't, If you don't want to believe in God, I can't make you believe in God or Jesus Christ. But the answers that you need are in God's word. So square yourself away. Square your family away. And then teach others. That's what's so important about what you do at Osprey. It's so much bigger. What you do at Osprey in training people, in, in, it's a big deal that you open yourself up to train other people. I won't do it. Blake, not, not to train people the way you train people. Yeah. We won't do that. Yeah. It, 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 is a, it is a big deal that you do that. And, and, and it's, it's important because what you, it, it's on such a higher level than just your training. It's not the, the shooting. It's you are, you are helping people square themselves away by teaching them a valuable skill that then they can possess which benefits not only them, but their family and their community. Well, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> you want an actionable step? There's your first step. You fat, lazy turd. <laughs> I'm being freaking serious, man. I'm being serious, man. Look, look, at, look at the generation before you. The generation before that. I, these men, when I when I look back on my on my father's generation, on my grandfather's generation, which are the only two I have perspective right. on, obviously, these men, they weren't bad men, but their entire life just revolved around just doing whatever their job that was their life, doing whatever their job was. I, I mean, they they didn't want they didn't want to be involved. They didn't want to challenge it. They just want to do their freaking job, man. It's like, we can't function that way. We don't have that luxury. Because of the construct and the ideal, the ideals of, of the United States of America, we don't have the luxury just to be that way. Well, you're looking at a couple of generations of folks that... <clears throat> Well, the prosperity of the 50s, right? Uh, the nuclear family and all that. The man got up and went to work. He worked the same job for 30 years, got a pension, retired. Put his kids through college. Uh, the adversity wasn't... The 60s became... There was adversity in the 60s, but it was self-imposed. The civil rights movement and everything like that created um, a lot of turmoil. And then uh, it was necessary turmoil, but it created turmoil. And then the uh, it started becoming um, philosophical hardships and not physical hardships. Now, yes, Vietnam War and all that, that was guys who went and fought. But as a, as a society in general, The, the 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 thing was get up and go to work put your head down they they still worked their their job for 30 years don't ask questions Got don't benefits. think my dad i love i loved him to death uh, he's passed he worked for the city of atlanta for 35 years he complained every day <laughs> every day but he got up and went to work came home every day kept, kept his head down did his thing got his pension even went back to work there after he retired as a as a supervisor complained every day but that was that was it. Keep your head down. We're, these days we're looking because of the way everything's so crazy, and you self reliance has become a big thing, like to the population that it wasn't before. Like it's become popular to be self reliant, which is good. Uh, me and my wife were talking about this the other day about the doggone um, where are those jokers up in like uh. Amish. Yeah. You don't ever hear nothing out of the Amish, bro. They got 
they got their stuff locked in. They're good to go. They don't don't matter what's going on in the world around them. They build their barns. They build their track. Uh, their 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 wagons. They make their own food. Yeah, they're good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they but, have but, something. Uh, they're good until they're not good. Their mm-hmm. their way of life is upheld by by the people who 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 who, who have chosen to well, here's make where, sure. Here's where I'm going. Okay, thank you. America is now full of people of different values, different backgrounds, different whatever. Um, they're a isolated community of humans that support each other. Um, Rome, just Rome alone. God knows. Well, there's probably maybe what fifty thousand folks around here in the city limits. Probably a hundred thousand if you look, you know, Somerville and all around. Um, I'd say probably most of the majority for sure are are of the same value system. Probably grew up in a church, whatever. But there's also people around here who have zero values whatsoever. There's a lot of drugs here and stuff like that. So unless you have a value system that you can empathize with. You're not those people. There's always going to be some something at odds. Um, and I hate I'm not bashing on Muslims, but I'm telling you they have a different value system than us. Um, so when push comes to shove, they're going to band together with theirs, and 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 the Christians are going to band together with theirs. So I ain't advocating any kind. Of, I'm saying unless you find a, a shared value system with people in your community, people that you're with every day around you're just doing it for yourself because without, without, and, and, and you said it a minute ago, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I can't make you believe in God, but the Bible will tell you the right things to do. Well, what most of these people who consider themselves atheists or most of these, uh, other religions or whatever. Um, but atheists, especially I bust, bust chops on is like, well, where do you, where'd you get your value system from? When you trace that question down in the root, they can't answer it. Yeah. Well, the Ten Commandments is what the answer is. Well, they don't, whether they want to acknowledge it or not, they didn't just get enlightened with some kind of value system. Don't hurt other people. Don't kill. Don't, don't, don't steal. Yeah. Uh, don't covet your, 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 your neighbor's wife. And with, without, stuff. without a value system, anything, any action is permissible. Exactly. So most of these people will tell you they have a value system and they know right from wrong. And I say, well, where'd you learn that? And they don't, it, the Bible, Sunday school is where they freaking learned it. And then they chose to, because of whatever reason, because Jim Baker and Tammy Baker were, were all effed up. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm an atheist now. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's just two humans doing human stuff. And you got nothing to do with Jesus. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so the value system comes from somewhere. You can also translate that value system pretty much across most religions, most religions. So anyway, you got to have some kind of shared values. Yeah, you know, I'm sure they can they can diverge at some point, but there has to be a base level of shared values well, or a community to well the, survive the, as a community. Well, yes, you're you're exactly right. I mean, it, the, in the United States of America, was founded on the shared yeah. value system, and that and that existed until, and this is why I, with the open border situation. When you got people coming in, not only unregulated, unchecked, but people of different values and sometimes opposing values, there's going to be problems. And that's where we're at today. There's problems based on that. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what have you got? You guys watched the news yesterday? Uh, the Palestinian supporters in, in Washington, D.C., desecrating statues. Yeah, I saw that. What not? Um, I wonder if they're going to get the same. You think they're going to get equal uh, justice as the January 6th? Yeah, uh, it crossed my, my mind, yeah. So probably not, right? Because it's politically expedient for the moment anyway. It's kind of funny to watch all these politicians and, and uh, celebrities. Now they're starting to have to choose sides when it comes to Israel and, and Palestine. Mm-hmm. And it's real funny to see who's, who's, who's trying to jockey mm-hmm. the right answer, so they don't get canceled. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. The fact of the matter is, though, check it out. I'm gonna say something controversial here. You can disagree with 
Palestinians, i.e. Hamas, murdering innocent civilians, and also disagree with Israel's heavy-handed methods that now I I'm not as read in on on what goes on in Israel. But look, man. Well, let me let me continue. They call it an open air prison. If there's how how many Palestinians are there? A couple million? If uh, maybe more than that. I may be wrong on the number. But it ain't an open air prison if there's two million people there. If if it feels like a prison, it's because you're making it feel like a prison. Uh, you know, create your community, make your community, make it make it good. But instead, the way America does business, and because of where America does business, this way everybody else does business, is there's a victim class, and then there's an oppressor class. So. USA, we're the oppressors. Israel's the oppressors, and everybody else is the victim. So, the way our culture works these days is anybody who's been labeled a victim is now their behavior is free to. They get a free pass for everything. Yeah, I, and that's that's absolutely wrong, but that's the way it is. I I can't understand, and and we'll 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 close. We'll we'll we're getting ready to shut it shut it down because we don't need to cover. We don't have to cover everything today. No, we, we can don't. come no, back and have not. a. Um, but 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 I I can't <laughs> understand why why people cannot wrap their minds around this issue or this war between Israel and Palestine. The 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 foundational reasons for their war. It, they are age old, yeah, yeah. age old reasons. Now, yes, in 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 every conflict, you have certain individuals that have certain agendas that that are that are wanting to do things for for their own personal benefits. Yes, I, I agree with you. But when we get down to the root of it, when 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 there is a group of people who say we want to go and take that land. Because we think that land belongs to us because we were there in ancient days and we want to take that land back. Or maybe they weren't even there. Maybe you just have a group of people who say, we want to go take this land to be our land. Well, that that group of people, they have got to go into that land and guess what their only option is? To completely obliterate the entire population of the land that they want to take. Okay? What, what, that, that is what we did to take this continent. We literally obliterated an entire population of people who had been living on this land for no telling how many thousands of years. We didn't take prisoners. We beat them down from every possible angle until we whipped and killed every single one of them who had the will to fight. That's what we did. Yep, that's exactly what happened. And so... If Israel says we want to take this land because we believe it belongs to us, they have you have no you talk about a heavy hand. What other option do you have? You got to drop the hammer, son. And let me tell you, if you're the people who are on the land, who 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 this other group of people is trying to come and take from you, you better hope you've got a heavier hand than they do. And if you don't, you get beat and you lose your land. But 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 you 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 can't just try to go and take a piece of land and just halfway whoop the people who are there and try to make deals with them and try to make and try to neg- no. You got to obliterate them. Well, Every single one that has the will to fight. It's an, it's it's literally an age old example of conflict. When you look at Israel in the Old Testament Bible, as Israel was moving 
through the land. When they, when, when, when the Lord God said, Israel, go here, he didn't say go here and make a deal with these people so that y'all can live amongst them. No, he said, go in there and destroy every last dog, person, woman, child. You got, you got to, you got to destroy them all. Now, that makes a lot of people mad, but that's what they did. That's what they've done over and over and over again. That's what we did to take ownership of the continent that we now possess. And if somebody ever wants to take this continent from us, you think that you think they're going to be able to come in here and make a deal with me and Edgar well, so that they can live amongst us? No, you're right, but the uh, form of uh, it, uh, it it's evolved. I don't want to speak in such hyperbole as to say there is an invasion, but with open borders and we don't keep track of who's coming in, there's bad guys among us. I'm a hundred percent certain there's, there's sleepers living in various little towns, just waiting on the word to go do whatever. Um, but yeah, that'll be minimal in effect to w- what'll happen if, if they, they tried to do what you're saying. Yeah. Yep, yep. And that's why that's one of the reasons that certain folks ain't ever going to give up guns, for instance, ain't, ain't, regardless of ATF, you know, notes that they send down once in a while that don't have a force of law. Oh uh, yeah. So yeah, you're right. That's warfare. That's what warfare is. Yeah. Um, modern society, they forget, they think warfare can be handled diplomatically diplomatically. Now there are, there's a time for diplomacy and, but with, with Israel and the middle East, uh, it, it's, it, this, this phrase has been around there for a long time, but, um, if, if, if every country in the middle East gave up their guns, every, everything would exist as it is. If the Israelis gave up their guns, they would be obliterated immediately, instantly. And all these pro-Palestinian people would then have to answer for the carnage of every child, every woman, it wouldn't. every animal, yeah. everything that was considered Jewish would be slaughtered to, to bits. 100%. Immediately. Um, so With no hesitation. So that's what I was saying about this victim-oppressor business. They throw labels around to to get PR wins and they don't understand it that the Palestinians you know, I, I don't think they're victims at all yeah I think they just exacerbate um, any any group that's a, a Muslim extremist group you know they get the sympathy they 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 always get the sympathy but then they do the most horrific things yeah we live in the upside and down we, and we somehow just they get a free pass because yeah. they're they're victims so yeah. Well, well, how much time have we been going, Edgar? Two and a half. Oh, yep. Dad gone, son. Five Dad gone. Well, uh, start running your your chops over. I, there, you know, Good I boy. enjoyed it, Edgar, because you know, I like I, I like to talk about stuff like this. I I I um. You know, I'm 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 a amateur philosopher myself. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I can't get Blake to talk about this stuff with me. Chili he talks about it all the time. I hear him. Chili won't talk about it with me. I, I so I mean, it was really to me. Blake, hey, any bit of wisdom that comes out on this podcast comes. From well, yeah, that's true. Thanks, uh, yeah, you're welcome. There, there really no wisdom was shared in this conversation. Nah, uh, just some thoughts just of some, some opinions. old men. Yeah, yeah just just some opinions. Yeah, biased opinions. <laughs> I might title this episode <laughs> "Old Men's oh, Thoughts." Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so no, man, I really appreciate your time. It was fun, and um, would love to be able to have you back on with our with our other mutual friend. Yeah, man. Uh, at some point, because we need to get down to the bottom of high or low ready. All right, oh, or high or low Lord. port. Yeah, I know you call it high. You call it high port. 
We need to really get down. So in all my classes, when I do classes with no, this right no, here, we can't get to the bottom right, of it now. Right. Wait, save it for all save it for next time right, we do I'll it. Save it for next time. All right. So we got to get. There's a lot it's, of. It's controversial. Also, there's a lot of things that we need to get to the bottom of, <laughs> yeah. and uh, these are fun conversations. So if you guys want to hear more conversations like this, uh, let me know. Let me and Edgar know. Uh, sh- it, and let us know by way of sharing the episode. If you share the episode, tag me, Chad Wright 278 Tag Edgar. Where can they tag you? Osprey Shooting Solutions. So tag Edgar and Osprey Shooting Solutions if you want to see more of these. Uh, drop a comment in the YouTube section. Uh, let us know uh, what you thought about our conversation today. And uh, if you guys want it, maybe we'll maybe we'll come in here and, and have another conversation and uh, get down to the bottom of some things like the the high <laughs> the high or low port, you know, all that. the stuff that matters in life. So, guys, thank you for tuning in. We'll see you guys. Hey, yeah, hold on. 18, 19, November. 18, Land navigation. Yep. And is that sign up on the website? Uh, TwoTeamGuys.com. But you can get there via OspreyShootingSolutions.com. Okay. Thank go, you. And go give yeah. Edgar a follow. Land nav. Let's do go it. Go freaking train. Yeah, you're right. I told you guys, Edgar's legit. Uh, he, he's one, he's, he's one of the dudes that you can go and train with and know that you're going to, you're, he's not going to be teaching you, feeding you a line of freaking sexy bull crap. Uh, no frills, no baby. frills, a hundred percent, man. So, uh, we'll see you guys on Wednesday, Lord willing for our regularly scheduled episode. Love you guys. Enough said. Sweet.